Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, whatever time of day it is for you. Welcome to the Silmarillion Film Project podcast. What number are we on, by the way? Uh, this is session remember. 24 of season, season three. three right? Yeah, session okay, 24. Okay, season three. All right, cool. Now I'll introduce, or I don't have to introduce. Over to you, Corey. <laughs> okay, all right, great. Uh, I've just been alerted that I failed to change one of the settings on Twitch, which is fun. Um, okay. There we go. All right. Uh, uh, so thanks for, uh, thanks for, uh, thanks for that. We're going to be, um, I'm looking forward to doing the casting as always. It's always fun. And as you say, Trish educational, as, uh, I certainly don't follow things closely enough to know all of the, uh, the people nominated and stuff. So it's always interesting to me to, uh, uh, to see that. Um, so today we do have uh, two special guests with us whom I wanted to uh, uh, to make sure to introduce to you. Um, Bree Melvin and Anastasia Bogle, who are have been huge contributors uh, to our uh, visual design elements. And these are the, those are the main things we're going to be looking at today. We're going to be looking at how we're going to be uh, uh, doing costuming, especially costuming. Um, but uh, but it's really, I mean, it's all about the visual presentation, which is such a big deal. We talked about this a lot during the session uh, uh, in season two when we were trying to establish the, you know, those those initial views of the of the different elf kindred and stuff. There are so many things you think about the. Uh, the 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 role that these different groups have the, the role that these different groups play in confusing people who read the Silmarillion right I mean one of the things that is like a classic problem a classic challenge uh, of Silmarillion readers is how to keep everybody straight like you know which group is which again and how are they connected with whom um, it's really it's really challenging and so being able to use the visual element, of course, you get that's one of the big advantages, I think, uh, of course, of the adaptation into the visual medium um, are the, that extra set of cues that you're able to, to give, but not just to keep them straight. Like, right? It's not just like that we need to color code the, the, the you know, the elvish kindreds or something. Um, but of course, what you can convey uh, to people about them. And, you know, there's sometimes in our discussions when we think about, you know, we're, we're trying to think through the culture and we're trying to, you know, answer uh, some 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 questions about, you know, what would they do and what are their attitudes about this and that and all that kind of thing. A lot of that, I think, you know, we're really you're really able to convey by visuals, right, by how you depict them, by how they dress, by their sets and all those kinds of things. Uh, so it's really fun to think through. Um, it's really fun to think through how we would do that, right? Uh, and I think this is a really fun... Uh, so let me just start off uh, by uh, thanking you, uh, uh, Brian and Anastasia, for the work that you've done. I'll thank you again at the end, but I wanted to make sure to say that at the beginning, we really appreciate uh, your contributions to this. Welcome. Thanks. Okay. All right. So, uh, uh, oh, but I almost forgot before we get uh, quick announcements, but only really quick. Um, uh, first, I do want to make sure to emphasize we have our summer camps coming up. I've talked about our summer camps before, uh, but these are summer reading camps uh, designed for kids ages like 10 to 14 or so. Um, our Hobbit camp starts soon. That starts not this coming week, but the week after. Um uh, so what is that? The 9th, the 9th of July. Um, so we're coming right up on that one, but we have our uh, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone camp to follow that, our Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe camp to follow that, and our Wrinkle in Time camp to follow that. So we have lots of options this year. Uh, strongly encourage you to check out signumuniversity.org slash academy. This is entirely free, uh, and uh, we have not only... Uh, daily uh, uh, class discussion sessions for kids to read along and, and, and come and ask questions and be part of that discussion. But we also have a whole huge fat like 50 page packet that we will send you if you are a, a parent or facilitator wants to get together a few kids to talk about this uh, to, for like we will provide you with a whole set of discussion questions questions chapter by chapter for the whole work as well as like games and activities and stuff to do for kids of various ages and everything it's uh really kind of awesome so and all this stuff provided to you absolutely free um we just encourage you to participate and help 
uh, help uh, the next generation of uh, readers really to uh, bury themselves in these wonderful works and, uh, uh, and, and really have an awesome imaginative experience this summer. That's the point of the summer camps, and we invite you to look into that, uh, signumuniversity.org slash academy. And then, of course, our next moot, we are uh, uh, having finished with Myth Moot, which was awesome. We are now uh, shifting to uh, looking towards the late summer and the fall moot season as our regional moots are going to be kicking into high gear uh, in this fall, starting with Bay Moot on August 18th uh, and followed not too long after by Middle Moot in Kansas City, SoCal Moot in L.A., and uh, uh, Carolina Moot. Though I think they're thinking of changing the name to Magnolia Moot for the South, which is pretty awesome. That's going to be in Charlotte, North Carolina uh, on November 10th. So um, lots of fun regional events uh, coming up, but, but in particular, uh, Bay Moot, not only because it's coming up first, but also because uh, the call for presentations was uh, extended, and that extension uh, expires mm, tomorrow, I think, so uh, now is the time to definitely get in on that. All right, those are the announcements. Let's move forward. So, we're going to start with costumes. As I said, uh, both concepts and some uh, uh, some some art to uh, visually suggest this. Uh, and in addition to Brian and Anastasia, who are here with us today, uh, Harangil and Marielle on the discussion boards have uh, uh, have contributed a lot, and we're going to be seeing some of their contributions uh, here today as we go through. So, all right, um, let's uh, so let's let's go. So. The Teleri of Alqualonde <clears throat> are where we're starting. Um, okay. Uh, which one of you wants to kind of walk us through your thinking about the Teleri? That was me. This is Anastasia. Hi. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so my thinking on that was, um, so last season we had mentioned that the Teleri, and specifically Tolerisea, would have a lot of sheep on it, and so they're their clothing would be with a lot of felt mm -hmm. um, and sort of needle felting, all that kind of textile art goodness. So I wanted to extend that further into this season, but also at this point they would have met the Noldor and the Vanyar. Yes. So, and I associate specifically the Vanyar with very, very fine weaving and needlework. Um, so I wanted the Teleri to have learned from the Vanyar. And so what I was thinking in this season is that we could have them playing with the juxtaposition of this very heavy felted material with this very light sort of chiffon, gauzy kind of textures um, so that they'd still have sort of their roots in Tolerasea, but then we could have cool shots of them walking along the beach with a really flowy garment blowing in the wind. Right, right. absolutely. <laughs> that does seem uh, uh, necessary, right? Yes. Um, and so I found the image of Ophelia by John Everett Millet. Um, and it's it's evoking what I'm thinking, but it's not exactly mm -hmm. what I'm thinking. So mm -hmm. if you look at her bodice, it's very encrusted with right. um embroidery and probably some beadwork and stuff on there and it, you can tell it's like very heavy and structured but then the fabric floating in the water is very light and has transparency to it mostly because it's floating in water but <laughs> right. it sort of gives that that juxtaposition that i'm thinking of right, right. and then um brie also mentioned about the stones that are on the beach and all the shells and things yes going from the beach to their clothes which would be a fun thing. Yeah. Um, so that's what I was thinking. Also mainly, it's also mainly um, like our main description of Aqualonde is that it is a beach and that it, they covered it in jewels that they were given by the Noldor. So yeah. the or clothing might reflect like the whole idea of those two things meeting and also reflecting that uh, image. And also the idea of having like a more solid top and with the more encrusted things with a flowy thing kind of um, creates the image of water flowing into a more rocky shore. Mm -hmm. So you get the mm -hmm. contrast. So it's right. naturally looking like a beach. Right. Right. 
Yes, the the beaches, especially for the for the the Teleria Valqualande, you know, because of course they're very remarkable in that they're the ones that go to Valinor, but stay furthest from Valmar, right? You know, if the Vanyar are the ones who come over most closely to dwelling among the Valar. It's not that the Teleri are avoiding the Valar, but we're, we're told they rarely even go in, right? I mean, even when everyone else is at the festival, the Teleri are still out on the beach, right? So they're very much, you know, on the shores and associated with the shores. So it does make sense to be really focusing on that kind of beach element, uh, uh, trying to evoke that. Yeah. Um, cool. So one question that I have is I'm thinking about uh, kind of evolutions and connections, right? Because, of course, the Teleri are, you know, as I was talking about the confusions people have with with Kindred and the Teleri are like obviously the biggest defenders in this regard, uh, the Noldor and Vanyar. You know, with the Noldor, we got the different households and everything and we do get some distinctions as we move forward, uh, you know, whereas the Vanyar sort of remain monolithic throughout. Um but with the Teleri, of course, we get all the different subdivisions. Uh, and not only that, but them also changing over time. Uh, do you see do you see season three? So with with season two, we had the, you know, the journey and then all of the divisions occurring and the uh, time on Toleresia and then finally the move to Alqualande uh, at the end and their friendship with the Noldor and, you know, we, 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 we got hints of a few things. We didn't spend much time on it in season two. We got hints of a few things like Arwen and Finarfin getting married and that kind of thing. Um, but, um, but anyway, um, do you see introducing changes? Do you think that we should be thinking in terms of changes from the Teleri at the, you know, in season two to the Teleri in season three? Cause this is kind of the, the sort of the final and steady state Teleri, right? In season three that we get. Well, um, I kind of think me, of them. Go ahead, you, three. You can go. Oh, okay. um, one time. Um, me? Okay, who's going? You or me? I'm going to say you. Go. you. Yeah, I'm going to mute myself. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> There's a slight delay yes. in all podcasting that causes mass confusion. Yes, exactly. Um, okay. For me, um, in terms of all, all the else, really, uh, between wa- their awakening to this state where they get to Valinor, that's like a big move and it's big time of change and it's kind of um, a a tentpole. And the main changes for all of them between that time period are mainly moving from a stationary but primitive culture to a migratory culture and then back to a stationary one but Mm -hmm. more technologically advanced. So it's... it's, I, I tend to think of it more as a technology change more than a culture change, but obviously the, the main culture element is uh, whether or not is more based on utility because you have these changes between staying in one spot, but they have limited resources and they haven't learned anything yet to moving a lot and probably not being concerned with more decorative things and then getting to a place where they have everything, they, they don't need anything anymore. They don't, mm-hmm. So it's going to be more, uh, less you... Uh, less utility and more decorative so um yeah so i wouldn't besides that uh, i wouldn't think there would be any huge cultural changes between say like um what our season two or what or season three would be right as compared to like once we start going to bellarian right exactly well and and i was kind of i was thinking about this when you guys were talking about like the gems for instance uh you know moving from the beaches to their clothing and stuff um the gems are on the beaches right because when the noldor give them gems at first they don't they well they don't value them in the same way that the noldor do right so that you know they don't uh they tend to just kind of strew them around and and enjoy the effect right they like the fact that the beaches are now glittering with gems it's not that they don't appreciate them um but they they're not in any way possessive and they don't um and they don't seem to and i one of the ways i've always taken that also is that they're a little bit less um focused on personal ornamentation and i remember in season two when we talked about the noldor we were emphasizing a desire for you know gorgeousness of decoration with the noldor um do you how would you guys characterize 
the difference between the Teleri's approach to sort of self-decoration and the ornateness of their costume uh, versus, I know we're going to talk about the Noldor later, but just kind of in, as we're focused on the Teleri, um, are there any uh, kind of distinctions that you guys would, would introduce there? Um, for me, the Teleri, especially in Alqualande, their clothing would be more an expression of fun and creativity than it would be about um, possessiveness mm -hmm. <clears throat> or um, showing off skills. So the kind of distinction that I have between the Vanyar, the Noldor, and the Teleri of Alqualande specifically is um, the Vanyar would be less about showing off but more about the process of making mm -hmm. so they would be they would care a lot about this the very fine needlework but from far away you wouldn't really notice it it's when you come up close and you see oh they really love right. doing this fine work they really love because when i do needlework and knitting and that kind of thing i find it very sort of meditative right so i think the vanyar would have that kind of um relationship with it and then the Noldor, it would all be about showing off their technical skill and like inventing new and fun ways to sew stuff. Right. right. Um, it would be about technique rather than, than yeah. 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 That makes sense. And then the Teleri, it would be um, just fun and expressive and creative. And so they might actually, because you mentioned the, the lack of possessiveness, they might yeah. just share their clothing with each other, be like, I like that garment that you're wearing. And then that <laughs> other person gives that garment to them and then they switch. And, you know? Right, right, <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. No, it's really fun. And but I mean, you're right to emphasize. And this is something I think, you know, especially with the way that we focus on the Noldor and, and them being makers and, and you know, the, all that stuff. Um, it's easy to kind of, I, I don't know, I think sort of shift over much in that direction and and for like all the elves are makers right i mean that's a that's an elvish thing it's not just an older thing um and i agree uh with you as like that sort of possessiveness right especially in the second half of season two as we're doing the unrest of the noldor you know we wanted to be moving in a more and more sort of showy direction right um Ultimately, with armor and helms and things like that, as we were discussing last time, or last time I say, like a year ago. Um, but um, uh, but anyway, yeah. So having uh, having that difference, I love the concept that you guys are are putting forward about the the Teleri, the costume of the Teleri being more marked by fun, just sort of being more whimsical and fun. Um, tell me what that more about what that would look like. Like, how would we convey? that kind of like playfulness uh in in costume um well, going, going back one second though um one other difference i was thinking of just now between um say the Noldor, but more specifically like the feanorians and mm -hmm. the teleri would be that the teleri seem to be like we describe their clothing as basic being uh taking design elements and being a visual representation of where they live and I feel like their creative process differs in that they're sort of just making fan art right. <laughs> of the Valar and appreciating what the Valar did, whereas the Noldor become increasingly more, um, their art's more about themselves. Right, right, right. And when they drift away from, like, representations of the Valar, though we do see the, like, um, Turgon making the trees and stuff, but... That's kind of about it. The gates he makes and all that are not really related to the Valar at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's interesting. With so so th that the Noldor, Noldor art would become less representational then. You were suggesting. Yeah. Okay. That's that's really interesting. Just more self-centered versus right, right. Uh, appreciating the others, and they go off by themselves too. Another right. mistake. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah 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 that's cool and, and of then course, yeah sorry go ahead go ahead and then what i was thinking about how to show the fun in the teleri's mm -hmm. garments is i always think of textile artists and kind of what they wear and i don't know if any if a lot of you have met a lot of textile artists <laughs> um <laughs> but what i notice about their clothing is that it's they do a lot of um, experimentation, and it's not always beautiful, mm -hmm. 
but it's always interesting and it's <laughs> right. always um and it's always like trying new things and well i already said experimentation so that's redundant um <laughs> um but it's it's like not always in line with what's in fashion or what's in style it's kind of what they want to do um so that's kind of how i w would express fun in that sense so that not their clothing would not all be beautiful but it would all be interesting right right yeah that that is and because you know one of the effects right that we would want to maintain is that while while we obviously don't want the Teleri to be shabby or anything like that yet nevertheless we want to create the situation where when Feanor and his sons come into Aqualande they should be kind of looking down like looking down on them right they should they should uh you know feel themselves to be above the Teleri or you know to 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 consider the Teleri like sort of rude or primitive and you know sort of uncultured in some sense you know kind of similar to the dynamic of you know a uh uh like an aristocrat not an not, not an aristocrat looking at peasants but an aristocrat looking at you know merchants and and uh, 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 you know people who are not gentlefolk, but um, uh, but still you know uh, uh, neat and comfortably well off, they should be able to give themselves airs, right? Um, and I think you know if the if the Teleri are dressing in a way um, which is like individualistic and even kind of weird, uh, but lacking the kind of dignity that I would think the Noldor would kind of insist upon, given that sort of high focus on themselves, right? And that, uh, that increase in their own pride and their own, uh, their own, their own focus on their own, uh, well, on themselves. Um, another major visual difference at that point when they're meeting each other after, you know, they've already been in Valinor would be, uh, that the Feanorians are going to be much more military looking yes. at that point too. Yes. Yes. Versus uh, civilian. Yes. Yeah, and actually, it would be a really great way to emphasize the um, that particular dynamic, like the uh, between the t at the kinslang, right? Is if the if the Teleri, if what the Teleri are wearing is not only not armor, but explicitly like wispy and gauzy and that kind of, you know, like to really emphasize the, the, the difference between, you know, we're dressing in this like foamy, gauzy stuff for fun and you guys are wearing metal, right? And now you're attacking us with swords. Uh, it really does, uh, uh, it really does emphasize the uh, inequality of that mm -hmm. situation. Plus the, the shape language. I mean, the Feyenoordians are all pointy triangles. <laughs> the yes. Teleri are all wispy. So. Right. right. Wispy, <laughs> billowy, difference. flowing things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool, cool. Um, I see. Mariel was asking, uh, uh, was making a, a Jane Austen parallel. No, the thing what I'm talking about would not be not be the Bingleys, like Miss Bingley uh, to, to the Bennets, though that's close. I'm thinking more like... Uh, uh, with the Noldor and the Teleri, I would think it would be something that would be closer to like Lady Catherine de Bourgh to Mr. Collins, essentially. Mr. Collins is not a peasant, right? He's a gentleman, uh, but way below uh, and looked down upon by the one who gives herself very great airs. Um, okay, cool. Um, yeah, yeah, neat. Karita says that she can imagine the Noldor doing, like, a lot of sketching and design and swatch work before they do, you know, before they wear anything, uh, whereas the uh, the Teleri might, like, add to garments as they go and remake and edit and change things sort of spontaneously. Um, uh, I, can, I can definitely see that. Yeah, cool. Okay. Anything else you guys wanted to add about the Teleri? Nope. All right. Next and, slide. <laughs> and, 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 and we'll get back to uh, talking, I, I think, we'll, to some contrast and stuff when we get to the Sindar and everything. Cause obviously, we want some kinds of connections. But all right. So let's talk about the Feanorians as we've already started talking about the Feanorians. So that seems fitting. All right. So you guys are thinking definitely more, more, more complex and more structured. Yeah. Yes. And I think that reflects their like love of gems, too, to have. Yes. Clothing that has these angles, but then also like a bunch of them, because you can fold fabric in a certain way 
to do this. Anastasia knows more about it than me because sewing and me <laughs> don't really work out so well. <laughs> um, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I was. Um. So these two images are from uh, the 2014 adaptation of La Belle et la Bête. Mm -hmm. Um, and the designer in that, if you look at um, La Belle's costumes, there's a lot of like folding work and smocking and very detailed structural elements of the fabric. So it's very much playing with the fabric, not so much embroidery right. and beadwork. Right. And that's kind of what I associate with the Noldor is they would try very hard to invent new and novel construction techniques. Yes. They'd play a lot with structure. They'd play a lot with how to fold fabric to create interesting shapes. Um, and they do, 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 what was the other one? And at, by this season, they would have um, very strong shoulders and collars because that's kind of associated with not being so nice um and <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yeah and and uh the next slide uh with Bree's drawing um actually has that silhouette that i'm thinking of right um and the and Bree can sort of speak to the, that the, the, yeah the, yeah yeah and the, t the two dresses on the previous slide um they're more examples of like level of detail and technique right um, obviously, uh, color scheme and the actual period of these dresses don't match because uh, I don't. I, this <laughs> Not is at like, all. No, this is like what 17th, 18th century stuff. Right. I, yeah, I kind of get that stuff mixed up. But um, yeah, we're dealing with a much more medieval uh, culture. So, right. but like taking elements from these later um, human trends and applying them as. Um, ways to make the elves look a little bit more technologically advanced but still using a medieval aesthetic also helps um separate elves from the more well the the, the designs for men because both right. of them are going to be, be medieval but there needs to be some difference between the two yeah and as you say to have that be reflect reflecting essentially technological advancement um uh just to have the 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 clothing of the noldor be you know, made in ways and of materials that men just can't do and initially wouldn't even imagine. Um, I really love this idea. I, I certainly wouldn't have thought of this, but uh, that that does strike me as very Nolder in this. You know, if we're going to make fabric, right, we're not just going to make fabric and then decorate. We're not going to leave the fabric as a as a, 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 you know, a blank slate and then decorate it, right? That would be like the minimum that you do, right? But even better <laughs> is if you're going to be making fabric, why not make fabric in cool ways itself? Like let's make an art of the fabric making uh, and folding and, and, uh, and, and of course of the design itself. So it's not just dresses with lots of jewels on them, right? It's, it's about, uh, it's about the, the, so, and I have to admit also, this is kind of exciting for me because I've never even heard the word smock used as a verb. Uh, how does one smock? <laughs> what does that even mean? I don't even understand that word. Um, smock. Oh, we've learned a new word. I've so learned yeah, a new word. This is awesome. <laughs> um, smocking is basically you... Hmm, how to describe without actually showing you. <laughs> I, I um, it it's hard. similar to folding. Okay. And like pleating, but you don't iron it. So you take part, like you pick up little stitches in the fabric and then you pick up a little stitch somewhere else and you bring them together. Okay. And depending on the pattern you use to pick up the stitches, you get a different sort of pattern in the smocking. Okay. Right. right? So a lot of people are used to seeing this, the smocking that's on sort of child's clothing that's made with elastic thread in the back and it's right. very linear. Right. But if you pick up threads in different, or if you t make stitches in different patterns, you can make different patterns of smocking. Oh. So is so is if you like look very pinching. Okay. Right. Yeah. So if you look very closely at the white, or the the off white dress there. Yes. On the skirt, the top of the skirt area. Yes. That I'm pretty sure it's smocking. Okay. Um, I can't like the. So that is a dress that on has the been image smocked. Was not great. Does one use the past yes. tense? Like, I smocked that? Yes. It begins to sound kind of vulgar when you say it like that. But yes. Okay. <laughs> right. Good. Well, after you're done, 
you're kind of done with the dress. You're like, oh God, I worked on this so long. I hate it. My <laughs> fingers hurt. <laughs> so maybe it <laughs> works. Okay. Okay. Yep. Um, when, while we're on the topic of the, the difference between the men and the elves, mm -hmm. one thing that I had thought about um, just as a general sort of difference that would be continued throughout the series is the idea of mortality versus not mortality. Yes. So the elves having this idea that they live forever would make their clothes fit them really well and right. not be able to be altered very easily because right. they're not expecting to die. They're not expecting to have you to pass get, on their clothing. Yeah, exactly. You don't get hand-me-downs right, in Elvish families. Yeah, or change right. dramatically in change decade. <laughs> right, for instance. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, but the men, on the other hand, they would have these sort of garments that would be passed down throughout through the ages um, that would be made in such a way that they could be altered very easily to suit many different body shapes. So that's kind of what I was thinking about the Noldor here as well, is they would be very interested in fit yeah. and in like particular shapes um, that would not be easy to be altered. Right. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, now, though, it, it, it does raise a sort of question. Which do you think? And on, on the one hand, I because I, I, I can see this going either way, right? Either... Uh, elves being immortal would be more likely to design clothes with the assumption that they're going to last a really long time, right? And perhaps part of their, uh, part of the, you know, the virtue of elvish clothing, right? The way in which, uh, you know, hobbits might call them magical garments, right? Would be that they might endure, they might last for a really long time, um, much more so than human made garments, for instance. But I can also kind of see it going the other way, whereas you say, like, you know, men don't have as much and they're going to be handing down their garments, gener you know, uh, as long as they can. Whereas the elves, like since the design and the making is part of the pleasure, might not, you know, design their clothes to last forever because they want to keep making them. Right. They want to make more. Um, which do you, th uh, do you would you would you think like, which of those or both? Which do you think would be dominant? Mm -hmm. I can kind of see it going. In I mean, they way. have more mm -hmm. time to make them. Right. Exactly. Well, yeah, that's the thing. <laughs> you know, like they, they have infinite time, right? So they they could take you know months and months and do nothing other than like make one you know uh, new suit of clothes, right? Because why not? Like it's it's their creative expression, which is kind of their job, right? So yeah, I think it would depend on the culture as well. So the Vanyar, for example, would just have one garment and make it last. Mm -hmm. But I think the Noldor would be more inclined to have like wardrobes full of right. just clothes. <laughs> right. right. And the Teleri, because they would be just having fun with it. Some of their clothes would last a long time, some of them not so much, and that would be fine. You know? Right, right. Yeah, I think that's a really good the Vanyar, I agree. The Vanyar would because uh, they wouldn't spend a lot of their time making clothes, right? Even if things like needlework and stuff were something that they did. Um Nevertheless, I, I don't see them. I, I would see them going more towards weaving, really, even like a, like tapestry weaving and stuff like that sooner than I could see them uh, spending a lot of time in like the making of elaborate wardrobes for themselves, uh, uh, as I think you're rightly mm -hmm. suggesting that Noldor would do. Um, uh, you know, I'm not even sure that it would be like it would result in multiple outfits because um I mean, I'm not sure about this, but I mean, like, when I read more medieval stuff, uh, they'll usually have some girl who's working on dress because they had nothing else to do because they weren't allowed to do anything else. <laughs> <Right>. um, <laughs> and it's like they're they're just taking an older dress and, like, working on it, mm -hmm. like, that they've had for a long time. So they ha usually have, like, the one good one. And it seems like they just right. keep adding to it over time. So right. maybe, like, they have, yeah. like, yeah. a more important one and they it just becomes more elaborate over yeah. the centuries so it's not it doesn't look like patch jobs but it right. kind of is like it's staying repaired right it would be really but it's interesting also getting more actually, decorative. To, yeah it would be really interesting to have like an older character who could appear in like three or four versions of the same dress over the course of multiple like you know, we come back to her you know several episodes later and she has the same dress but it's there's like something different you know it's you know it's, it's now like more elaborate than it was before that would be kind of funny yeah, the trick with well, that is, 
um, from a practical standpoint, um, a lot of the time when people would rework old dresses, they'd have to cut off a lot because the act of sewing a dress ruins the fabric, basically. Okay. Um, so the seam itself would have holes in it, right, right? Right. From the needle going through the fabric. So you couldn't use that piece or you'd have to put some kind of beadwork on it, which I'm sure the Noldor would have time to um, to fit, sort of figure that out. Be like, this part has weird holes and folds in it that I can't get out right now. Right. So I'm going to do other stuff with it. So, like they'd have time to do that. But that's a consideration when you think about reworking garments in that way. Right. Right. Yeah. Let's re sorry, uh, Marielle was just asking a very interesting general question. Do we have any examples of elven craft that is temporary or transient? That's a really good question. I mean, I think the the first thing that immediately comes to mind would be music, essentially. Uh, I mean, there there's a way in which you... I mean, of course, it's it sort of obviously it depends, but I don't see... It's not like I expect... Uh, most of the music that's done by the by the elves to be you know like and then that song was like memorized and played again and again um i would expect them to do a fair amount of improvisation just like to play a beautiful song that is a beautiful song and is never played again just like it was before right so that's kind of a different situation they hoard so, things. yeah they do <laughs> they're known hoarders they're known hoarders and preservers of things, right? So, uh, yeah. certainly, if you have, when it comes Maybe to they clothing, make elaborate food, <laughs> they eat it. Right, food, there you go. Yeah, that that. Like that the time people temporary. post pictures of their food on Instagram, that, that, that would go. That's <laughs> right. <temporary. laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, you're right. Actually, cookery is like the the. Uh, it, it, classic example of transitory art right you can't like or like ice sculpture or something um but uh but yeah no that's true that's true food would definitely be one example um but i guess i, I guess thinking of the thinking of the parallel that i was just making with musical composition though I guess that's the sort of parallel that I was suggesting as one possible way of understanding at least some elvish approaches to uh, uh, to this kind of art um, is thinking of it not as like I'm going to create a work of art and then preserve it like, you know, so that it will always be the same, like a painting on display or something like that. But rather, um, you know, I'm going to. I'm going to to compose a work, and every time I play it, it's not going to be exactly the same, right? Because the the pro it's it's not just that that one act of composition, you know, when I when I thought of this song, when I when I when I when I when I wrote this melody, that's not the creative act, right? The creative act is the continual performance of it, and every time it's different. Every time it's a creative act, right? Every time it's it's enacting this. Um, you know, the, uh, this, this artistic beauty, right. And to wondering if any of them and which of, and if so, which of them, uh, might approach, uh, clothing this way, essentially, um, because clothing is well, it ties, more ephemeral than other it ties forms of back art. What we were saying about the, the clothes, like editing it and right. it changing yeah. over time. Yeah. So more evolution versus like temporary, also, going to what you were saying about the music, we do have a more close hand um, view of how the elves like create music, mainly because of Lord of the Rings and Fellowship of the Ring of the Hall of Fire. Right. Like, we do kind of get a glimpse of like, what they're doing. Right, right, right. Exactly. Remember the details, though. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, and it's hard because it's that's told from the point of view of Frodo, who's in his like half trance, half sleeping state, you know, at that point. So it's uh, it's it's not extremely detailed. But um, um, but yeah, yeah, exactly. Now, Nick was just saying, I don't know that we would classify composition as less artistic than performance, just different. Right. No, exactly. I mean, and that's that's exactly what I'm what I'm what I'm thinking there. Um, but um, yeah. Yeah, cool. Well, I want to go back for a second. We were only very briefly on uh, uh, Brie on the slide with your design for the Feanorians here, um, thinking about some of the stuff that we've been talking about uh, uh, here in general about the uh, about the Noldor costuming. Um, 
do you want to uh, sort of talk us through a little bit more about what your um, what you were sort of wanting to convey in some of the design choices here? Um, like most of the art that I did, that's going to show up in this PowerPoint. It's a few years old, right. <laughs> so. Um, but I mainly t my um my general direction when I do anything with summary and stuff is I tend to focus on color mm -hmm. and shapes as they relate to the character, not necessarily individual character, maybe like the character of a group or a culture. Uh, so I mean, Feanorians are always red. Right. right. <laughs> this is the rule. Right. Um, and I mean, it fits the personality. It fits the whole like fire motifs that we have. We actually know they had red plumes. Um, we get red is associated with not necessarily bad people, but maybe, uh, in general aggression. And it's just, it's, um, pretty ingrained to us as a species because it means usually means danger. I mean, mm -hmm. blood is red, um, a lot of poisonous things are red. So, um, it works. And then, uh, in terms of shapes, I tend to do with, uh, them, I tend to do triangles, but I don't do triangles because triangles are usually used for villains or mm -hmm. and whatnot um because they're more threatening uh and they have um limited sides compared to like a square has more sides right. so you get more more three-dimensionality versus uh more an archetypal villain which is a little less three-dimensional um so but um i don't do it nearly as much as like sauron who is way more like way more triangles than a Feanorian. <laughs> right. So I kind of balance it off by giving them more flowy things because I think of them as very, um, uh, I mean, they're, they're like, the, they're, they're supposed to be like the royal princes, but they're, they kind of gave that up. But right. that element of them is still there. Mm -hmm. So there's this, this, uh, it's more showy. I think of them as more showy, mm -hmm. less, I mean, they fight a lot, but I feel like they do it in style. Right, right. Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree. I mean, I think they would be they would be the kind of people who would show up on the battlefield looking lovely, you know. Uh, absolutely. I think that that's really important. Um, yeah, yeah. And as Tony points out... In terms of their armor, also, before right. I forget, um, I also was kind of... I don't really think about the materials as much until after I draw and go, well, what material could this be? But um, <laughs> right. I was making their armor bit more coppery color because we have that element where their, um, their grandfather really liked making copper things. So I kind of brought that element in. So sure. it's not completely uh, coming from Feanor's side of the family. They do have a mom. <laughs> right. Right. And it's good to, I mean, I also, I, I kind of like that even again, just kind of fitting with the, like if they're, if they're, armor were like you know silvery sort of burnished steel it would uh um uh i i really like how the coppery color fits in with the whole like reddish theme that seems to me to that seems to me to fit i like that um and a nod to to their maternal grandfather is a good thing you know i i i definitely like that yeah cool um, so you see in, uh, uh, you see them wearing a lot of, uh, like sort of robes, like floor length or, or longer robes as on the right when not in battle, obviously, but. Uh, -huh. uh I'm just mainly, I think mainly of my droves like that when he's at his war councils, <laughs> I always picture him in this elaborate robe. It's just, it's just there. <laughs> okay. It's permanent in my brain. <laughs> okay. Cool. Um, I'd also like to t bring attention to the shape that Bree has made there. Mm -hmm. So like the shoulders and the neckline are very structural, yes. very big. And then it goes down into like a smaller waist and then straight down to the floor. Yeah. And that's kind of the silhouette that I was imagining for them. So yes. it might al not always be floor length, but it, if you squint your eyes and just look at the shape, that's kind of what it would be. Right. Right. What I was imagining. Yeah. Cool. No, I agree. And I really like the effect, um, you know, Brie, both with what you were talking about, about triangles and uh, Anastasia, your point about more elaborate structuring of garments and stuff. So, yeah, both those shoulders and uh, uh, and the, the stiff collar 
make uh, a lot of sense to me in that regard. Uh, and you even have that in what a sort of more casual looking sort of tunic effect over here, like the one who's got his back to us over there. Uh huh. Yeah. And I don't really have the detail on this, but um, I probably if I drew this today, I'd probably add a lot more em embroidered embroidery detail stuff right. like that. Right. Just or just pattern pr like older style of um, what's it? Screen printing with, mm -hmm. with a lot of elaborate detail designs that you see in like Mongolian cultures. I looked at a lot of Mongolian uh, like detailed stuff when I was uh, designing them. Yeah. Um, uh, question on, uh, Twitch a couple minutes back. Would you see Noldor's clothing being like jewel toned or, uh, like the, I mean, I knew we were talking about red with the Fanorians, but, um, and I do think, I mean, I was joking earlier about color coding the elf families, but actually a certain element of that is, is a little bit handy. I am completely <laughs> in favor of color coding them because I do nothing else with my spare time. <laughs> right. I am right. also completely in favor of jewel tones for the Noldor. Jewel tones, yeah. Yeah, you like that? Or like, or not, even even if it's not jewel tones, like strong colors. Right. Right, so yeah, not... I give them strong colors, and I usually associate them each with a medal because I'm not going to make them wear like a helm of jewel because that doesn't make any sense. Right. Like you don't, yeah. you don't, it's not protective. So I usually try to evoke the idea of precious metals by having the more armor stuff next to the color. Okay, yeah. right. Another association I sort of have um, that's a difference between those who went to Valinor and those who did not is. Um, there's a pretty distinct line in dress history between when there were only natural dyes and mm -hmm. when there were synthetic dyes. Mm -hmm. So synthetic dyes tend to have be more brightly colored and tend right. to be more color fast. Right. Whereas natural dyes tend to be more cut, so they they have little sort of more browns in them, and tend to be less color fast. So that's kind of what I was thinking for Valinor is that they would have the color quality of a synthetic dye, except it wouldn't be synthetic because that's not the world we're in. <laughs> but it would have that that strength of, of color and that brightness. Whereas when you go to Middle Earth, um, not Middle Earth, well, when you go to Beleriand, technically, yeah. <laughs> technically Middle you would Earth, find yeah. more colors with like more brown, like more browns in them. So not as bright. Right. Right. Um, yeah. So they're using. So I think I was subconsciously right. doing that. Mm -hmm. I didn't do it for that reason, but I was mainly doing it because, um, like the elves um, in Beleriand, they stayed in Arda. Whereas, right. I mean, it is Arda, but they separated them. The others separated themselves and went to this place where they weren't really ever supposed to be. So they kind of lose their connection with the land. So then you have these elves who have colors that match the land more, whereas then you have these guys who are just colors that match their personalities more. So. Right there's a visual disconnect between them and the land that they're in. Right. Right. Yeah. Great. Now, Tim Fisher has a great question. Um, what about, would, uh, would anyone wear silks? Would silk happen? Oh, we had a lovely discussion about that last year. Ah, okay. um, so, so silk, the problem with silk is that you have to kill the silkworm to get it. Uh, so what happens that. is the silk moth, creates the cocoon, right? Okay. Or the, no, the silk moth lays the egg, the egg becomes a worm, the worm then makes a cocoon. Okay. And um, in nature, the worm burns out of the cocoon, uh, right? Uh, which which breaks the fibers. Right. So if you get a silk that is made with, or humanely, where no worms are killed as a result of the making of this fabric, um, <laughs> then... It's rougher because you have to spin it more. Um, right. Whereas if you if you boil the the cocoons before the worm comes out, you can take the entire single length of the silk fiber and make that into cloth. So it's very fine. Mm -hmm. um, so we had an idea that maybe there would be a creature in this world that would produce a fiber similar to silk, but that would not need to be killed in order to make that silk fiber. I feel you know, like so you're trying to a... say 
that the Feanorians yeah. wouldn't be okay with killing a bunch of worms when you know they totally would be. <laughs> well, um, we were talking about it in the context of the Great Journey, so it wasn't quite right. to the Feanorians uh, yet. Right, exactly. Um, but that was kind of the conversation that happened. <laughs> it would be. It, it I mean, would be of all, very... the most likely to wear silk is them. <laughs> right. No, I it's totally agree truth. with that. But it would be. It would be really a really interesting. I mean, talk about talk about subtle, right? But it would be a subtle sign of their moral decline, right? <clears throat> when 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 they began wearing silks, um, yeah. Yeah, that would be uh, that would be interesting. Nick suggests perhaps that uh, the elves, being elves, could coax the worms out without damaging the fibers. <laughs> <laughs> what they sing to them? Right, exactly. So like, uh, <clears throat> it's it's sort of like the <clears throat> the silkworm version of uh, of elves riding without bit or <laughs> or saddle, right? Uh, <clears throat> they have a way with the silkworms, right? They sing to them. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, now Marielle is suggesting by contrast that perhaps the, uh, making of silk could actually be a dwarf secret. Uh, and the, and, and the, you know, so that would certainly recreate something closer to the European medieval situation, right? Where silks come from the East and we don't know really how they're made or, or, you know, you know, it's, it's just kind of a mystery, right? Um, so there could be like the horrifying moment when the elves learn how many worms are killed in the making of these garments, <laughs> um, <laughs> because the dwarves wouldn't tell them. I mean, I have to admit that the the concept of like dwarves working in silks seems to me really odd. Like, I have a really hard time trying to wrap my brain around that. Um, I mean, I guess I don't know that I could make a, an absolute argument for why they shouldn't do that. Um, but certainly the, the idea of a external culture and uh, secrecy does seem to fit them. But yeah, go ahead. Um, there's an interesting point about silk that might change your mind. And that is that uh, people used to use it as armor, loosely right. termed armor, right. against um, sort of um, arrows because right. what would happen is that the arrow would go into the person and spin around and the silk oh, would spin right. around it. Right. And then you could pull the arrow out. It prevents the barbs from, from sticking. And the, yeah, yeah. I, I heard about this. It was, yeah. it was, that was a Mongolian technique, wasn't it? Am, 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 mm -hmm. I, I yeah. seem to remember hearing about that associated hey, with the Mongolians. again. It's yeah. like it was meant to be. <laughs> There you go. Exactly. Okay, right. So, um, but uh, I think there was discussion about the dwarves not having arrows until they meet the elves. Right. I think I remember that discussion. Right. So, though, yeah. Though, could go either way. Right. Though it could, uh, it could be a like an application of silk which dwarves developed post meeting the green elves <laughs> when <laughs> defending themselves against I just don't know if they would pay enough attention to worms on to a worms, tree to find exactly out exactly right yeah. So. Yeah. But I mean it wouldn't be maybe if they were living in rocks they would have paid attention to them but right yeah I don't know yeah yeah I mean if the if we were imagining that the silkworm were subterranean it would make it easier Right. Um, it would make it easier both <laughs> to explain why the, uh, you know, the elves who were just mostly traveling across the land and then leaving. Right. Um, didn't know about them. Um, but. Um, uh, well, it's a lot easier to picture the elves stopping every time there's a field of flowers to look at each new flower that they see that they have never seen before versus exactly. the dwarves who are. Like, you see Gimli going into Fangorn, and he's kind of being obtuse, and he has, like, the axe. He's not really thinking about the trees in the same way as a human or an elf would. So they, I just, it's not so much proximity to the trees. It's more just, like, their relationship to them. Right, right, right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah, I don't know that I'm 100% sold on the dwarf thing. I could, I could, I could more easily see the dwarves being the one to adapt it for anti-arrow purposes <laughs> once they learned of it. Uh, and of course, if we were careful, I'm thinking about the uh, the issues that the uh, 
script folks were were having with needing something besides pearls um, to give, you know, for for the Sindar to give to the dwarves, um, you know, yeah. in the what do the dwar what do the dwarves get out of this partnership um, uh, question, um, you know, we. Yeah, we'd had the problem of saying, well, they get pearls and they really like pearls. And, and the, in addition, they can also get more pearls. Right. And, and that, 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 that <laughs> seeming kind of redundant in, in the end. Um, so something like silk would be, you know, dwarves might be really interested in that for uh, to to use as materials in some way. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, because silk is, as you probably know, a very useful, strong fabric. Right. Exactly. Right. Because it. The, the reason nylon exists is because they were trying to find a different way to make a silk-like fabric for parachutes. Right, right. Right, during the war. Right. So right. it could be a very good gift fabric in that sense. Right. And thinking of nylon, actually, someone else was suggesting uh, a little while ago. I forget who it was. Um, uh, was suggesting that... Oh, Tony was suggesting this. Um, would they? Would the elves make any synthetic fa- fabrics i mean the, the noldor might do that um i mean obviously the proviso would have to be i mean of course you know what <clears throat> tolkien's it seems like almost the only time i can only think of two occasions on which tolkien himself actually spoke about clothing it's not not a topic of conversation that he uh, he he got on very much in his writings, uh, but the, almost the only things I can remember him saying. I'm not talking about descriptions, um, of which there's little enough when it comes to descriptions of clothing. But um, but when he like in his letters and stuff, when he's talking about clothing, it's either to talk about how he likes fancy colored waistcoats uh, or to talk to complain about modern clothing right about zip fasteners and 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 uh and, and things like that so obviously you know shift towards things like you know elastics and nylon and zippers and things like that he hated um and that it, for tolkien was a big part of his kind of complaint about how as modern technology was increasing everything was getting shabbier Right. That like modern clothing look more drab and and uh, and I mean, he wasn't wrong. <laughs> I know. Exactly. Right. And it's the same. I mean, they the same specifically co- dying to design clothing for females to last less time than clothing for men. Because they, cause this whole thing about like women buying stuff, usually, especially like 1950s housewives thing. Right. So right. it's like we're forced to keep buying more things because they fall apart. Right. And then you get that whole thing from hitchhiker's guide with us turning into birds because of it <laughs> right 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 um yeah yeah it's so it's i mean it's the same complaint he had about architecture right with like ugly modern concrete buildings and stuff like that um and one of the you know in the places where he talked about this whole trend in more detail he talked about you know like the the pride of a craftsman in his work compared to just you know, modern factories just kind of churning stuff out. Um, so obviously all of that, st- I bring up all that stuff as a kind of, you know, asterisk proviso on the issue of synthetic fabrics. I'm not suggesting, obviously, I don't think, I think it would be very bad for us to move in a direction that would even look like that kind of thing. And yet, um, I mean, Tony's right that some kind of synthetic fabric would certainly be possible. I mean, we could have something which, was represented, you know, which was portrayed on screen by silk, right? Um, even if it is not silk that is actually derived in the same way from the silkworm as as real modern silks are. I mean, I don't know the history of synthetic fabrics. I don't really get how they are in existence <laughs> right. at all. I don't know about that stuff. But Anastasia might. But um, so I don't know at like what point we started doing stuff like that, mm-hmm. and. I don't know how much of that technology would make sense in a medieval world. So I right. have literally no clue. <laughs> right. Um, well, synthetic fabrics. Hmm, it's a tricky question because um, polyester that everyone knows and loves, it's um, a petroleum byproduct, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, but things like 
rayon, and I think I always mix up this word. I think it's viscose are made out of uh, cellulose, but they like mush them up and mix them with different chemicals in order to make a fiber out of them. Mm -hmm. um, so it kind of depends on what you're talking about in term when you're talking about synthetic fibers. Right, right. As to whether it applies. Right. Um, so I can imagine, and it, it also depends kind of on how you perceive the Noldor interacting with chemistry. Right, right. <laughs> um, so, so I can imagine them inventing a way to make a fiber that was different, but I think we would have to really divorce ourselves from our modern idea of yes. synthetic fibers yeah. to imagine that. Yeah. yeah, in terms of sciences, I think the elves are more of a natural scientist, geology sort of thing, maybe. Right. Uh, uh, biology, whereas the only people I can think who would be really into chemistry would be the dwarves at, at well, in I, this as actually early just, as possible anyway. Right, exactly. Well, I just thought of another suggestion, actually. Um, you know who seems to me to be the most likely group of people to make synthetic fabrics? The Numenorians. The Numenorians would be into chemistry. Mm. I think. Uh, I mean, especially later... Yeah, 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 exactly. Especially, especially later in the Second Age, as the as the as the Numenorians start to decline. I mean, this is something that gets toned down. The dark Numenorians. Yeah, the darker Numenorians, right? You can tell that they're evil because they do they they do they're they're chemists, right? I'm just kidding, uh, uh, mostly. But um, no, but seriously, in uh, Tolkien's early writings, of course, you know, in the Lost Road materials and and the early fallen Numenor stuff, it's very clear that the Numenorians by the end of the second age uh have the, the, you know the the sort of the original part of the myth is that the numenorians had uh progressed to essentially modern technology they had flying machines and uh uh, uh cannon and and uh you know uh, uh iron side ships and everything else uh in their final attack on valinor um and the reason Sauron's army wouldn't face Arpharazon when he lands in Middle Earth uh, is that Arpharazon had artillery and <laughs> Sauron's people didn't, so they they ran uh, on, on the first bombardment. Um, now again, that gets toned down in you know the Akalabath in the Silmarillion. We don't see that anymore, uh, and Tolkien was clearly backing away from that idea as time went on. And I'm not suggesting that we you know uh, actually follow that original plan and have um, you know, the, the, the Numenorians attacking Valinor in Blackhawks or anything, but I do think that technological advancement, uh, accelerated technological advancement, I think could be something that really could be a marker of late Numenor. Um, and that's where we might want to introduce things like synthetic fabrics. And even the Numenors get evil enough that maybe they actually do use zip fasteners, you know, like that could be, <laughs> you know, they, they might even decline to that point by the end. Uh, and the technology of zippers was lost to the sea. Yes, exactly. <laughs> oh. come back again for few more thousand years. Exactly. exactly. Why everybody got to hate on zippers? <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. Uh, <laughs> but anyway. Um, okay. So I agree. I mean, it, it would be kind of interesting. I mean, Tony was suggesting, uh, you know, on the subject of the question of like having the sort of pseudo, uh, the Feanorians make a kind of pseudo silk. Um, you know, Tony was saying it, it could be like the cloth, the cloth equivalent of the mysterious material that the Silmarils were made of, right? We don't have to explain it. Just say that, like, you know, the Noldor have uh, developed this technique and nobody else knows how to do it, and so they're the only ones who have it. And you know that. I mean, that could work. We don't have to explain it. Like, we're not, we're not going to be doing a, you know, a, a a sort of documentary of the. Um, you know, textile manufacturing techniques of the of the Feanorians, right? They could uh, uh, they could have you know some kind of of uh, uh, technique that they. This have stuff never found. shows up as like exposition or anything. Right, this just yeah. shows up in the behind the scenes DVDs. That's where they, <laughs> that's about it. It's just you know you got to actually physically make the costumes. So, right, yeah. right, right, exactly. Um, yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, Shall we move to the next slide? Let us do that. Okay.
<laughs> All right, the host of Fingolfin. So here we have. Um, so I'm guessing, thinking back to what uh, you were saying about metals here, we have mostly coppery metals with the Feanorians. Uh, with the host of Fingolfin, you have more more gray. So that would be more more of the shiny steel. Yeah. Um, the usually when I draw stuff for first age, I tend to draw it around the period where the men's stories start because right. those are like like the three big stories of the Summerian. And that we spend the cl like most close time with, like it's not a wide view. Right, right, so right. these would be less Fingolfin and more Finken. So after ah. we're already in Valerian for a while, so it's well, when they're crossing the Hill Caraxi, I wouldn't think of it being so militaristic right. yet because yeah. they're not guarding the the northern borders of Valerian from Engban. So, and I think that their fortress up there, they pro since it's in a mountain, they probably had some access to some metals. Um, what's the word for metal? Yeah, or uh, yes, or yes. or yes, yeah. So, it, but color scheme, like I usually, Fingolf and you think blue, and it's not even. I don't know why, but we all think it probably because it's the opposite of red in terms of character colors but you just like if you look fan look up fan art online fingolfin is always blue and <laughs> it's probably also related to like the helcaraxi and then you get the ice colors and stuff like that yes yes yeah no, i know i i really like it's also blue in the north the so fur. yeah yeah i know exactly i really like blue as the dominant color uh of the host of fingolfin actually the yes. the question of um the crossing of the helcaraxa brings up one of the big questions that i had so um the Nolar crossing the Helcaraxa, how inappropriately dressed are we going to have them be, right? They're not going to be all bundled up. I mean, they can't be, right? They didn't come prepared for an Arctic trek when they left Valinor. Um, and when I, so when I say inappropriate, I not only mean, uh, you know, not wrapped up head to toe in furs as you might expect for an Arctic trek, um, but even like how many of the like how many of them are wearing you know, like gowns and stuff like this as they're crossing <laughs> the Helcaraxa because they would have left in that right? I mean that would have this would have been their everyday wear. You know they're like the fancy smocked things that we were talking about before. And I totally am going to go out of my way to use the word smock as a verb as often as I can uh, <laughs> uh, in the next few days. So <clears throat> anyway, are, are, like, so how many of them are, are going to... So that's what I mean when I say like inappropriately dressed. They might look... I mean, we, we don't want it to be absurd, obviously. We don't want to... We don't want to inspire laughter at the elves that are crossing the Helcaraxa. But uh, but again, I'm, I'm not, so I'm just thinking of... I mean, because, of course, the, the crossing of the Helcaraxa is the primary... Um, the primary uh, uh, storyline of the Host of Engulfin during Season 3. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, in particular, that's what I... Cause, I don't see a huge distinction, you know, uh, Bria, as you suggested, uh, dominant colors and things like that. And, the, and, and the, there would be some differences even at, say, the kinslaying, right? When we get um, the people of Fingolfin coming in and engaging in their part uh, of the kinslaying. And they're armed as well, right? Unlike the Teleri. So there would still be a contrast, perhaps less of a contrast, between the people of Fingolfin and the Teleri as there is between the people of Feanor and the Teleri. Yeah, I think color-wise... But like if you think of the Fingolfin contingent of the Noldor, I think maybe they might have some yellow accents while they're in Valinor because I think of like the Vanyar right. and so maybe like and also um oh my god, I'm on a podcast so I can't remember everyone's names all of a sudden, even though I normally know all the names. <laughs> this happens all the time, but, uh, I know. The third right? brother. Yeah, Finarfin, yeah. Finarfin. Um yes. right, Finarfin. Um yeah. Um, I tend to think of him as having yellows as well. I mean, he's the, he's the blonde child. So, right. um, and he kind of separates from them. So that yes. color would go away. Yeah. And they, after they cross the ice, it'd be complete. Maybe it'd be replaced with white. I'm right. thinking yeah. of this just now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. My sort of idea, do you, I don't remember there being any indication in the book as to whether after the kinsling and all that, they had time to prepare for any kind of journey. Well, do you 
So it yes. sounds like they just grabbed all their swords and ran like both groups. Um, yeah. The only prep I can think of is that Valinor got dark, so maybe it got cold, and they, but it, not Helcaraxa cold. Right, not Helcaraxa so, cold. I mean, plenty of time passes. I mean, they travel up the the shore from the you know the, the, so a substantial amount of time elapses between the kin slaying and the crossing of the hell Caraxa. Indeed, we even are going to have an episode with them camping, like after the Feanorians leave in the ships and before they go on the hell Caraxa. So we're even suggesting the passage of a certain, much less time, but still a certain amount of time between when the Feanorians leave and when they start crossing the hell Caraxa. So there's time for them to do some preparing, but they don't really know what they're preparing for. And, um, Anyway, are we going to have them? So we should talk about furs. Because for me, right? it Shouldn't depends on whether... So, but go ahead. It depends on wh- whether... So, um, so, so basically, if they leave for the journey immediately and have mm-hmm. no time to prepare, they will be wearing whatever they were wearing at the Kinsling. Right. Right? right. If we assume they had a couple of days to prepare for a journey they will be wearing traveling clothes. Now, as to their preparedness for the Helcaraxa, how do you pronounce that? Helcaraxa, that's just right. Yeah. Okay, right. <laughs> um, I, it, you, it doesn't get cold immediately. So they will be encountering colder and colder weather, and they mm-hmm. will be encountering animals with furs that they can use to keep themselves warm, which is something that I wanted to use as a sort of a distinguishing feature something. of yeah. the whole host of Fingolfin after the crossing. Yes. So they they will be becoming more and more prepared, but once they get to like the icy part where basically nothing lives, that will be where a lot of death happens and a lot of not preparedness right. happens. Right. And then after they've crossed the Helcaraxa, they will have all of this cold weather wear. And then one of the notes in this slide is that um, from there on, um, furs will be an important part of their ceremonial and court dress. Yes. As, really a, mean, like as a way of remembrance and I as really a like way that. of saying, hey, um, fan or people, you yes. made us all die and we're not going <laughs> to let you forget it. <laughs> yeah. Memorial in a couple different ways, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah not only for their own sake, but, but for also, the sake of Fanorians. Yeah. But also, hey, we live in northern snowy mountains, and we sort of learn from our mistakes. <laughs> right, yeah. there's that too. Also that. Yeah, Hithlum is not. Yeah. Is also, not, the, uh, the fur now. helps. The fur also helps them look more like good guys, relatively speaking, between all the groups, because it's usually will make a round shape and circle. So I friendly. So, yeah. Right. 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 Yeah, no, I, I, I really like that idea of fur. Be- and th- that can be a, a real distinction. Like, the Feanorians can never wear fur. Like, we, we should we should have them, you know, uh, that that can be uh, a really absent... Not that everyone in the host of, uh, you know, Fingolfin must always have fur on at all times, but, but to make sure that the Feanorians never have anything in fur uh, ma- makes a lot of sense. And I think that, that just only those who cross the Helcaraxa uh, wear fur uh, is... Uh, uh, is is cool. Yeah, I, I like that. I like that a lot. Um, yeah. Um, I mean, of course, it's one of the challenges that we talked about, you know, back way back in doing the episode. Um, it's one of the challenges of depicting the Helcaraxa uh, crossing because, of course, one of the factors here is that these aren't humans. These are elves, and their relationship with the elements is different than ours. Um, Nick, of course, is reminding us about the crossing of Karathros and how comparatively little Legolas was affected by that, right? So, yeah, um, that in the movie, that shot of him walking on the snow, uh, I'm happy. Right, right exactly. I remember that shot really well as a kid because I was like, he looks like Blink from The Legend of Zelda, and that's pretty much was. <laughs> How I got into Lord of the Rings. <laughs> you did look like Link from The Legend of Zelda. I was like 11, so I mean, yeah. it was influential. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So yeah, no, it's, um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I think there's a difference between Caradras and the Helcaraxa though. Like we're talking about yes. Arctic. In the right, we're talking about Arctic and we're talking about like 
weeks and weeks of travel. So mm-hmm. yeah, water. yeah, yeah, and right, exactly, and icy water and and everything else. So yeah, no, it's clearly, but yeah, right. The challenge is how to visually when you don't have any point of comparison, right? Like we can't have any you know useful control groups of human beings freezing to death while the elves go on, right? So we can't. Uh, it's it's hard to convey. They are enduring way more than any human could even begin to endure, and it's so bad that even they are suffering is is challenging. I don't think it's that hard because um, you always get people watch movies, me, um, <laughs> where you're like they are they should all be dead, they should all be dead right now. <laughs> like right. every action movie, they should all be dead right, <laughs> right. now. And really, anyone crossing the Arctic without any giant, even if they have a giant, you're like you're all dead. Right. right. So it's like. They're elves, okay. Well, I guess they're not dead because they're elves. Right. No, they look cold, so it sucks. And that's really all we need to know. That it's miserable. You don't need to know, like, oh, how is their sucking compared to the sucking of another race? Like, right, we exactly. just need to know how they feel in the moment. It's their story. Right, right. Yeah, no, that's true. Um, and it would be really interesting to... Uh, one of the things that I would think... I would so they would have some furs, but I would still think that they would be underprepared. Like it's not like every single one of them would be all bundled up in fur. Like they don't have enough time to um, get that many furs, right? So they would have some fur, but I would imagine thinking again what we were the all the the costuming stuff we were talking about about the Noldor in general, and especially as many of them are dying, right? Uh, during the crossing of the Helcaraxa, in the latter stages of the Helcaraxa. Um, I can imagine many of them would be basically wrapped up in 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 we, we would see many of the, the 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 clothes that we might have seen earlier, you know, being worn gorgeously by uh, by by people just kind of crudely wrapped a- around as extra layers. Right. Um, you know, somebody yep. like Absolutely. wrapped up in somebody else's dress, basically, just to as as a, a desperate extra outer layer of, uh, of 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 and to see it being, you know, uh, being torn and 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 frozen and and everything. So it w- would be a, a really interesting um, way of kind of conveying the extremity that they're coming to. Yep, I was just thinking, it's like um. Yesterday, yesterday you were telling me that um you thought about the Teleri having like sheep and stuff from Tolaris era and stuff. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. That's what you told me. Uh well maybe when they steal the ships they steal some wool. We're making off with your with Blanket your, with Blanket. your Blanket. ships. And we're taking the sheep too. And you can't <laughs> stop us. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean though. <sighs> The host of Engulfin has livestock. They at least have horses. Like we know for a fact that they have horses that they brought with them from uh, from Valinor, um, and they would almost certainly have other livestock that they would bring with them, right? Because although you know they packed in a hurry when they left, it's not like they left without any thought, right? I mean, Fanor was trying to hustle them along and not give them time to have second thoughts, so they had to pack quickly, and he told them to pack light. But they're still moving. You know, this is not, they're not, they're not going on a spontaneous day trip. They're, they're, they're relocating to Middle Earth, and so they're not going to take no thought, you know, for how they will support themselves and stuff. So uh, assuming there are um, assuming there is a uh, there are domesticated animals among the Noldor, which we know they have horses. Would they have cows, goats, sheep? They might do. Possibly. You know, for a film series that was filmed in New Zealand, it's kind of surprising how little sheep there are in the Lord of the Rings movie. That's true. Shockingly small number of sheep. Yes, yes. My elder son was particularly disappointed by that. Uh, and for exactly the same reason, like New Zealand, like sheep capital of the world and, and uh, almost no sheep. In fact, is there ever a sheep? Do we get a sh- single sheep shot anywhere? The Shire, probably, the Shire? if anywhere. Sheep in the distance? I, I don't know. Remember. I'm just guessing. Yeah. It seems like they... I remember there were, like, pigs. Yeah, we got pigs. Because they were very big pigs. Yes, yes. Because <laughs> the hobbits are pigs. Yeah. not big. I don't remember yeah. their sheep, though. That is shocking mm. in retrospect. Uh, I didn't think... And then the you time. get places yeah. like Iceland where there's nothing but sheep as well. Right. And we're in a more Icelandy area in this part of the story. Right. Of course, they're brought there, yeah. but 
non natives, but yep. Yeah. Um let's see. Timothy, I don't think they would have had well so uh, Timothy is raising the question of uh of wagons. Would there be wains? Um with you know, so would an old or have a wagon train? Not all of so only the Feanorians leave Valinor in ships, right? Um, they, uh, most of them are still on land the whole time. So they could, they would presumably, right? Leave Valinor with wagons. Like they'd have some, they'd have some. Well, this is the wings. question that I have is that they're all kind of expecting to go on the ships and then they don't. And so did they go back to get more stuff before no, they left? They, they can never go, go back. back. They can never go back. So they definitely can't go back, but they what so their expectation would have been that there would have been trips, right? They would have ferried stuff and they would have been able to, to you know, whether they take the actual wagons or whether they unload the wagons and leave the wagons behind or whether they're able to disassemble the wagons and bring I mean, remember we're immortal, right? So like we, we can take lots of trips, like we can take time with this. You know, they wouldn't be in a in 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 a hurry in that sense. So clearly the presumption, once the ships were acquired, the presumption was um we're gonna we're going to all get ferried all us and all of our stuff are all going to get ferried across. It may take a bunch of trips, but that's okay. Um, it's only then when they're abandoned that they realize that they have to go over. Um, Hakan, that's what I'm thinking too. Finrod is carrying a big bag of jewels the whole time. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. It's, 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 it's yeah, Didn't yeah. he bring a bunch? Right. He did. He, he did. doesn't drop yeah. them ever. He doesn't set them down. He carries them the whole way. <laughs> exactly. I, I have to admit that uh, I bo- I'm, I'm pretty sure that in my younger years, uh, reading the Silmarillion, I think I there was a point when I realized that I had the visual image of Finrod with like a huge backpack, uh, you know, like <laughs> chock full of gems uh, from from Valinor. Um, I but I, the more you know, actually thinking that through, that seems really unlikely right he would have brought wagons obviously surely they would have brought wagons they need supplies anyway so um so i've got to think that the um i've got to think that the noldor left uh um Tyrion with a wagon train uh and that that wagon train has been going up the coast um again with the expectation that uh it or at least its cargo would have been ferried across in the ships once those had been acquired. Um, but because remember, they didn't know about the Helcaraxa. Like that is, they knew that there was a way. They knew that the, that uh, like Orame rode Nahara across to Middle Earth, so they knew there was a land uh, bridge uh, to Middle Earth, but they didn't know what it was like. Um, uh, so them they being don't sort of really need wagons either. They. They could have stolen the small boats from the Tillery since they were already stealing boats anyways, and they could... I mean, they walked <laughs> well, along shore all the time. Right. They could maybe have, like, on sticks or leads and walk with them. They could. Well, it's two yeah. things. The reason I... don't I know th- how that well that would work with shoreline, though. Right. Well, exactly. The two reasons I suggest Wagon Train is that, number one, um, we know for a fact that they... I mean, it says that they went up the coast, so we know that not all of them were on the sea. Like, that that was not plan a and moreover it's feanor's plan to take the ships of the teleri i gotta think that uh fingolfin and certainly finarfin whose wife was teleri i cannot imagine that finarfin left Tyrion with the assumption that you know the teleri were going to supply them boats he would know what the ships of the teleri meant and how unlikely it was that they were going to join in and certainly how impossible it was that they were just going to give them their ships. So I have to think that even the majority of um, the Noldor who left Tyrion were not planning for a sea voyage at all. Like that wasn't on their radar screen. That was Feanor's idea, right? That he was going to uh, facilitate their trip by getting ships and by trying to, 
to swell their numbers by trying to recruit the Teleri uh, and to facilitate their travel, their crossing um, by getting ships. But I can't think that Fingolfin, or especially Finarfin, that that was plan A for them. I got to think that was totally unforeseen by them, which means if they left Tyrion before Feanor even revealed the idea that he was going to approach the Teleri, I've got to think they when they, you know, on the, the moment that they step out of Tyrion, they're assuming they're doing a land journey. Um, so I, I got to well, think, I think that we've they, just answered yeah. our question. Yeah. They're prepared, but grossly unprepared for the Helcaraxa. For the Helcaraxa, right. So they would have to, <laughs> if they did have wagons, they would have to convert, um, you know, to sledges and stuff like that, you know, which which they could do. I mean, they would adapt in that way. So we could see Burn the wheels sledges. for heat. <laughs> Burn the wheels, exactly. Right. Well, fortunately, we now, the positive side is we now have all this fuel. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, I, yeah, I, I would think that they would have stuff. Now, uh, Nick was asking, are the elves not big fans of wheels? <sighs> well... There was a discussion about that, yeah. but I don't remember exactly what forum it was in or who was part of it. I apologize. Right. Nick is suggesting pack animals rather than uh, wagons. Okay, but... Okay, here's the thing. Maybe okay. because people think wheels and they think dwarves because it's mechanical. Well, I mean, the wheel has been around for so long. It's one of the earliest inventions. It's kind of ridiculous to think that the elves wouldn't use, use wheels. Yeah. And this is my main argument that they would definitely be using wheels, but maybe not in the way people are thinking. They built all those towers. They had pulley systems. They had pulleys. <laughs> Don't tell me they did. Yeah. yeah. Clearly. Clearly. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, the idea of elves n never using pulleys and things like that is, or, you know, not using the wheel as simple tool, you know, um, it, it would almost be like imagining them not using They did using all that levers. weaving, too. So much weaving, yeah. though maybe that was less of the wheel and more of that yeah. square thing that I don't well, know the name of. Yeah. That depends on what kind of loom you're talking about, whether yeah. there's lots yeah, of wheels. Yeah, I was like, a loom. <laughs> Does <laughs> I'm trying to remember, does Tolkien explicitly say that they don't use wheels? I mean, that they well, wouldn't I think... choose to use wheeled vehicles. I mean, like, so to say elves don't like riding in carriages, you know, is... That just means they not... prefer riding horses versus exactly. sitting that, that's in not, a box. That doesn't, to me, say the same, say that they would not use a wagon to yeah, Beleriand's not really travel. famous for its roads, I would think. Right. So, and I think exactly. there's a distinction yeah. to be made between wheels and gears. Right. Yeah. You know? Yes, gears. So, exactly. Exactly. If you have a mind a, of a metal and wheels, vehicle. right? When right, when Saruman is described as a mind of metal and wheels, um, it's gears, I think, specifically that are being evoked there, not not uh, uh, you know, round wheeled conveyances necessarily. I mean, it's clear, for instance, that you know, in Gondor they use wheeled vehicles, right? They they have wagons uh, and everything, and that's not evil uh, per se or a sign of their decline. Um, yeah, I, I agree. Gears, gears. That's the big. That's the big thing, and that's always what I have uh, believed that <clears throat> Tolkien is referring to with the mind of metal and wheels. Um, when, you know, Saruman getting some of his precious machinery working, right? It's the machinery, it's the gears, it's the, uh, it's the engines. That's, that's what's, that's what's sort of morally questionable, right? But I, I can't imagine yeah, that a the cart... industrial side of it, yes, not like a mill, yes. they bread. Gandalf drives a cart, <laughs> right? I mean, you know, into, uh, into. See, into Gandalf the Shire. approved. Yeah, Gandalf carts are Gandalf approved. Um, yeah. So, uh, so yeah, I, 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 I can't, I, I don't think, yes, by preference, again, no, elves are not going to ride in like 18th century carriages. Right. But that doesn't mean they don't use wheels. Um, yeah. And even Gandalf has a preference to ride. I mean, Shadowfax, he just brought a wagon because he had all his fireworks. Because he's got stuff. Right. Like, so yeah. Presumably when elves have stuff. stuff. Yeah. But, but the road thing is a really good point though. I mean, if you know that you're setting off across rough terrain, even if you don't anticipate the Hell Caraxa, right? Nobody expects the Hell Caraxa. But even if you don't expect the Hell Caraxa, um, I mean, they've got to, they can't be imagining that uh, the, you know, 
quite possibly mountainous um, land alongside the coast up the you know up the the coast of Araman is going to be necessarily convenient for for carts. Um, so uh, uh, so I, I I definitely would. Um, the more I think about that, the more I think actually it would be more practical to bring more pack animals than wagons because no roads. Well, how often did they have to move stuff in Val- Valinor as well? So they probably just have the animals already. Yeah, yeah, no, but exactly. I'm they would, they would have to have them, yeah. That this is all good. Maybe we should go to the next slide. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great plan. I think it's time someone said it. <laughs> That's a great plan. That's a great plan. Okay. All right. The Sindar. Let's move on to the Sindar. Okay, so you had lots of lots of trees and nature stuff here? So the thing I wanted to do with the Sindar and the Nandor was um, think about a different sort of aesthetic that they could have. Mm -hmm. So a lot of um, historical Western dress is all about the waist and the bust and the shoulders. Like there's a lot of emphasis on, on bringing things in at the waist. And I wanted them to not have that aesthetic. (laughs) So to sort of be more interested in the shape of the garment and a overall shape than the shape of the body necessarily. Okay. So, um, so I had this idea of, and so there's two handbox that I have handbox are traditional, uh, Korean dress. Um, this one, if you look at it, it's the top right picture Right. is very triangular. Like just squint your eyes. Don't look at the details. Mm-hmm. Just look mm-hmm. at the shape and how right. triangular it is. Right. And I thought that could sort of evoke a hill with flowers and, trees and stuff on it and they would put a lot of natural materials onto their garments so i have a little sketch i did of melian on the bottom right and then brie found some pictures of uh fashion that has um natural themes incorporated into it Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but that sort of shape would be more their sort of ceremonial or courtly dress mostly you would see the sindar in very practical clothing but i still want to have that aesthetic of not accentuating the body necessarily but accentuating this sort of right. triangular shape right but not triangular in the evil sense <laughs> right. yes it would be an upset it would be it would be a pyramid right. rather pyramid than an upside or, or down sort of, triangle or sort of bell like yeah. rather than it's and, and honestly the shape triangle. is less triangular more of like uh this it's like an elongated circle in some ways yeah, yeah. it's not pointy at the top it's, really it's <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah definitely I mean, this is not a threatening look. No, it's not a threatening <laughs> look. Yeah. I totally agree. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, Myth Lewin also mentioned, it's it's in the notes here on this slide, that um, their court and ceremonial dress would become a lot more elaborate as they established Menegroth. Right. So you can kind of imagine this kind of shape that I'm trying to portray, this this sort of triangular pyramidal shape that I'm trying to establish going have that shape continuing through but becoming more elaborate as you get to menegroth so the earlier versions of it would be um pretty simple or or rough ish Mm -hmm. because i don't think they have metal yet i remember that um and then when they get to menegroth and they're interacting with the dwarves it would become finer and more elaborate because they have like a spot that they can live and they wouldn't be i mean they have other people make metal things for them right right so most of their stuff wouldn't be right yeah also like this stuff is all more more eastern ideas versus western ideas which makes sense because they're the eastern elves right versus Exactly. exactly and uh the um so in the they also would have no gems at all until they interacted with the dwarves, right? So we could start introducing some gems uh, into the uh, into their. I'm thinking about like how the 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 the, the manifestation of the of the more elaborate court dress. I mean, I, I hear what you're saying about metal tools, and so therefore uh, more elaborately sort of shaped clothing. Um, but um, um, but anyway, uh, the um, the decorations might quick thought here was flowers 
right? I would think, given like flowers spring up under Luthien's feet as she dances, right? And Mel- flowers are associated with both Melian and with Luthien. Uh, so I would think that the, the, the cinder in clothing would be the most heavily flowery, right, of all of them. Yeah. And yeah, that bottom is... left-hand picture is very good for that. Mm-hmm. Right, right. But go ahead, Bree. It's like we have a shape and we're putting a bunch of stuff on it. (laughs) Um, So like stuff they find, like that has, do you think that has naturally fallen off the trees anyways? Right. Um, Right. So So they probably would work a lot of wood um, instead of metal in terms of making like more like a bracelet-y stuff like that that's traditionally made with like metal works, but they just uh, do it with branches and stuff. And then you think maybe pinning uh, leaves and flowers and like we got this Melian look here, but I was, I also always have this other Melian look. She's probably has multiple, multiple outfits. She's a queen. Um, right. But like black feathers and stuff, because you got the whole nighting bird thing, and it kind of foreshadows yes. Lucian's uh, hair cloak later, which probably looks similar to like feather cloaks, anyways, even though it's hair. And so, just I mean, painting a bunch of different about feathers is you don't have to use actual feathers to evoke feathers, mm-hmm. right? So you can make a fabric that. And right. um, sort of, or or make pieces and put them together so that they overlap and look like feathers. Um, so yes, they could be picking stuff up off the ground, but they could also be um, making their fabrics and their textiles in such a way that they look like what they see on the ground. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, on this, on that subject, also Nick was suggesting bone and antler as other things that could be used for decorations. Oh um, yeah. I mean, yeah. these lead to, um, they lead to, like, the Mirkwood Elves, and you got the whole, like, deer thing and the hunt yes. theme going yes. on with them. So, yes. Yeah. So they came directly from Doria, so right. it makes sense that we have been that. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. No, that's great. That's great. Um, and we have the, do we have the, do we have the Green Elves next? No. We're so, oh, more Sindar. Okay. All right. Oh, cool. Because there's so many different types of Sindar. Right. Exactly. Really so are. this, these, uh, so these drawings that you have on the on the right here, these are the Philothrum specifically. Yeah, the one on the left is something I never finished, but we just kind of threw it in here last minute. Um, okay. This is more um, Kurt Kierden in the Philothrum. So uh, yeah. mainly thinking of like drapey shapes to evoke water, but then we have a lot of. Um, I did more like scale mail stuff, but I was trying to evoke more like pebbles on a beach right. and shells, that sort of image. So I'd probably have like a lot of patterns and stuff. Um, and then blue. And I tend to draw Tulare in general as dark skinned because the other elves aren't, but also I give them white hair. And it's probably, I know the reason why I do this. And it's because of the Atlantis Disney movie. <laughs> I grew up with it. <laughs> and you know, like, it's a water. It's a water culture, Mediterranean culture. You get the whole Atlantis thing. So I also think of the Teleri as, like, has Mediterranean elements, like medieval stuff, just because they have to deal with the ocean, right? And right. they're fishermen. So. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I'm been influenced by Disney movies from birth. So what are you gonna do? <laughs> exactly. Well, and you know, you one of the things that we were really emphasizing. Um, in just in thinking about their culture and about their their outlook, one of the things that we were gonna uh, even differentiating them from the from the Sindar uh, is that they're really like, they see their ships as their primary thing. Like the whole scene that we have where their cities are being overrun and, and destroyed, um, and they don't care, <clears throat> right? Like they've saved their people and they've saved their ships, and and so like that's you know, rebuilding the city is not really a big deal. And, the, you know, they're not particularly bothered by losing it. Um, so, I, again, I, I would think even kind of reflecting that having a lot of their um, uh, their clothing be essentially like clothing that, you know, designed to be worn on ships, you know, when you're when you're when you're fishing or sailing oh, yeah. or whatever. Um, you know, that that would be really dominant as if like, again, like being on a boat is their is their like home state. Right. I also sort of um, iman- imagined the bathroom as um, keeping sort of the a similar shape to where they had been at the end of season two, like the ones who didn't go across the water. Right, right. Um, so I have, 
I think the pictures that I drew are up on, are not in this slide, but are, or in this PowerPoint, but they're up on the, the forums um, of where they got to um, before they went over the sea. And it's pretty, they're, they're pretty simple shapes, um, like lots of rectangles sewn together and that sort of thing. Right. I think I remember seeing them a while yeah. back. Yeah, yeah rectangles mm -hmm. though. I don't know. Maybe it's because they're like a constant, like keratin's a constant, and squares are like these strong, solid, um, right. kind of immovable thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but we get like more, but they're still rounded edges because yeah. they're like a consistent, like, m like moral center. Right. Like curtains, curtains never like never loses this way. <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. No, you're certainly tr you're certainly right that uh, if there's one. If there's one constant in Middle Earth, it's got to be Kyrton, right? Uh, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, cool. Um, to contrast them with, like, northern Sindar, like the Sindar who'd probably be um, up in Hithlim before they leave because they're like, right. what are all these men doing here? Right. Um, right. Uh, I don't I don't know why. I tend to picture, like, Hithlim and, like, um, what's, what's my, um, Mithram is being snowy, but... Mm having trees with red leaves i don't know why so i tend to i was kind of made them a little different by giving them elements of red and maybe because they're closer to angband or something right. but um mainly though uh i was trying to make them a little more eastern in design right just to give variety but i haven't developed them nearly as much as the others hence why this is an unfinished thing from like three years ago that year sure sure yeah cool cool well, uh, let's kind of bring in the green elves here uh, and think about the Nandor, who are again connected, but more se uh, the more separated. It seems like even the way that we were um, talking about it through the episodes, it rather seemed uh, like the green elves had kind of cult were culturally differentiated from the Sindar even more, really, than the Sindar were from, say, the Teleri uh, of Aqualande. Um, so and I, so, uh, so tell me some about the elements that you're thinking of uh, here in these in some of these pictures. Um, so for the Nandor, I, I have a handbook again, but I don't want you to look at the details again. I want you to look at the shape and mm -hmm. see how it's very column columnar. Am mm -hmm. I just putting the right em emphasis? Yeah. Uh, columnar. Column. Huh. Anyway, you know what I mean. <laughs> I do, like a column. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. So very straight up and down like a tree trunk. Right. And then they have these beautiful headdresses that you can see at the bottom here because they're sort of looking up at the ends. Right. And they want their faces to be um, surrounded by beauty while they're talking to the ends. You know what I mean? Right. And actually um, and these, making these pictures... themselves tree-like in a sense, right? Like emulating yes, trees. yes, exactly. Also, that. it kind of evokes the whole guerrilla warfare, which I think they'd be the most likely to do. I mean, you think of them as more camouflaged right. and hidden in mm -hmm. the trees. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so their body garments would be a lot more simple than their headdresses would be. Like, if you looked at them straight on, there'd be kind of a disconnect between what you see on their top half and what you see on their bottom half. Right. You know what I mean? Right. Which is, again, um, tree-like, right? Like you've got the, you know, the plain trunk and then the, whether it's leaves or blossoms, you know, all of the, all of the fancy bits are at the top, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Interesting. And so, um, the, the, I just wanted to mention these headdresses at the bottom are Ukrainian and Polish artists trying mm -hmm. to bring back their culture. And if you want to look at the actual source material i can post that on the forums um just so we're not taking the artist's work without credit mm -hmm. okay cool cool yeah um yeah and i can see them um as you say like it's not it, just like trees don't wear blossoms all year round they're not going to be wearing bright colored stuff all year you know like you know blossomy stuff all year round um and a lot of times they would be very camouflaged and and uh, uh, you know I would think a lot of their day to day dress would be uh, even if they had headdresses not again not resplendent and gorgeous uh, all the time but they would have those no. right they would do that they would you know that th that that would be something that we could see them doing on sort of special occasions 
In yeah. fact, and they're the green elves, and yeah. therefore most likely for us to dress them up in actual things that look like green leaves. Right. Yeah. Right. And right. they'd probably use what was in season for their clothing. Like their clothing would be very oh, yeah. seasonal in that yes. sense. Yes. Yes. Like they would use fresh flowers, and those fresh flowers would die. So then they'd have to make something new, right? Right. Right. And they would be dressing in, in leaves as often, or more often, probably, than they would be dressing in blossoms or flowers. Or even just fabric that's cut to look like leaves. It doesn't right. have to yeah. actually be. I mean, they're not act, have super primitive. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Well, they, um, they would be at least to the point of knowing how to make fabric because they already knew how to make yeah. fabric at Quivian Inn. So. Right. 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 Exactly. Um, and they. Uh, I was just thinking of thinking of the, you know, them having both a, a you know a fancy dress that they do don on fancy occasions, um, and then the uh, more sort of practical uh, and camouflage oriented um, uh, uh, clothing that they would that they would usually wear. I'm I'm thinking of some of the scenes that we had between them, uh, and it would be really interesting to have them dress up like so they're in their fancy dress when they meet uh, you know when they meet Mablung and and uh, and Thingol right when they're when they're talking to the gray elves they would dress up in their fancy dress um, but when they're talking to the dwarves the dwarves they would dress in their like camouflage <laughs> battle gear basically um, it would be it would just it, w- it would be an interesting way to kind of signal the green elf attitude right uh, and uh, exactly kind of where they're thinking and and uh, what their opinion is uh, just by what they show up dressed in. Yep. And also the use of natural materials in a scene where you have the elves of Doriv and the green elves speaking to each other. You see that there is a visual relationship between them because they're doing similar things, but the green elves are just doing more of it. Yeah. Yeah. To a much more extreme. Yeah, exactly. Now, Tony asks, you know, the very sensible question, would they be using living plant stuff if they're interacting with ants? I would say yes, um, but of course this is trees the, drop things all trees the time. drop things all the time. Exactly. Yeah. No, I would think that that would be. I mean, okay. tree bird says tree bird says that. I think. Yeah. Right. Right. And even even thinking about how um, uh, quick beam was not offended, of course, by birds taking fruit off the uh, rowan trees, but he was offended by offended by them taking the fruit off the trees and casting it down and not eating it. Right. Um, so that kind of you know, the trees and the plants give and you use and share and have, but it's, it's you know, they're not going to be, um, they're not going to be like very few plants are going to be, you know, seriously damaged or harmed in the making of their garments, which brings up a really interesting point, of course, about the Nandor is that we have one challenge already in that they don't have metal tools. We have another challenge in that I don't think they're going to necessarily have that much in the way of wooden tools either. They're not going to use a whole lot of wood. They could use wood. That, I mean, they can use wood that's dropped in things, but they're not going to have wooden structures. They're not going to have, I mean, this their use of wood would be limited because that they wouldn't do. They wouldn't cut down trees for wood. Hmm. Um, we'll probably do more weaving. Yeah. So well, weaving, you can, you can do a bit, lot of sort of a bigger, with, bigger thing. Yeah, yeah. With bone tools. Right? Yes. Yes. And I bones would, and antlers fall to the ground all the time. Exactly. Like, yeah. Yeah. Well, agreed. Not all the time, but. Agreed. No, no, that, that's definitely true. So I, there, a lot of their tools, I would think would be bone and antler. Also stone tools. And stone, yes. Also that. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. Also that. Um, but uh, but I would think because I mean even you know when you think about leaves and stuff, even if you're taking leaves off of a living tree, um, it's not like you know, um, uh, you know what's quick beams you know, line, you know, and the Rowan has plenty and to spare, right? I don't think that Treebeard would grudge, you know, like a, 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 a burst of leaves, you know, for them to like take off of a living tree, even to like, I, I don't, I don't, I don't think that elves would be, uh, would be against that. Like they would, you know, it would be done with respect and living together and stuff. Uh, but and they'd be very careful not to kill the plant that yeah, they're exactly, harvesting from. Exactly. I mean, that can be done. Also, as well. someone who lives in the woods, I like literally live in the woods and surrounded by trees right now. They're falling down all the time. Right, exactly. It's kind it does of terrifying. <laughs> the trees, you mean? Yes. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> yes. Yes. Um, 
Uh, yeah, yeah. So, no, I mean, there's lots of opportunity uh, for that. But, yeah, I don't think that we need to... We just would be careful. Um, you know, when Tony's asking about living flowers... <sighs> You know, I don't know. Even that, first of all, would Treebeard be equally protective of, you know, grasses and flowers as he is of trees? I'm not really even sure. You know, um, would a flower that grows and then is, you know, sort of taken and used as decoration, uh, you know, is that an abuse of the flower? I don't think there's any way for her. You know, and to walk to the woods without damaging everything he's walking on. And exactly. Not exactly. like there's going to be an empty path. Right, right, exactly. Um, yeah, yeah. It could be also made very clear that they will never pick a, uh, a flower where it only has one flower per plant. Right. Like they'd right. only pick flowers from plants that make multiple blooms so that they can leave some so that that plant can then have seeds and right. yeah, I mean, continue I think... itself. We can, we can, you know, if we apply, you know, the sort of the general principle, right, that they are sensitive to the lives of plants and, you know, interested in working together with plants and not simply, um, you know, subjugating uh, plants or, or, or uh, you know, killing plants. Um, but yes, so I definitely, um, I definitely think it, it is a line that we can walk without having to, to worry about that too much. Um, and yes, I agree, Marielle, Yovana does seem more protective of the living things that take a long time to grow. Um, like I said, I'm not sure that a flower that blooms and, and I mean, like, I think of things like tulips and stuff It'll be like dead that. in a week. Like, exactly. Uh, tulip, a, a, a bulb flower, right? Um, which, you know, the bulb, you know, lives and, and flowers year by year. But yeah, I mean, those flowers don't last very long. And to sort of take and preserve them for as long as possible and to display them as widely as possible, not sure that that's not that that's an abuse, ultimately, you know, of the plant. And it certainly doesn't kill it in the sense of, you know, with any kind of permanence, right? It's just sort of harvesting the, 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 the flower when it comes. Um, I mean, they would need yeah, to. They're like, not ripping it up by the root. Exactly, exactly. Exactly. It's just so. like taking an apple from a tree. Right, right. Which again, uh, uh, you know, Quick Beam is explicitly in favor of, right? So, um, uh, yeah. So I, I think that we can definitely, we can definitely work with that. Cool. Let's talk about dwarves. Let's talk about dwarves. Yeah. Yes. Agreed. Okay. All right. Let's talk about dwarves. Okay. So we have the two different. Uh, families of dwarves that we're focusing on in this season, right? The dwarves of Belagost and the dwarves of Nogrod. Mm. So you guys were working with the kind of the cultural um, uh, principles, right? So we had the, 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 the dwarves of Nogrod being primarily the jewelers and those of Belagost being into weapons and armor is in particular. Yeah. Um, Apparently that was a discussion that happened. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in the forums, On the um, <laughs> these these pictures are specifically by Herangil. Mm -hmm. um, so is is that person on the chat right now? Can they speak to their work? I don't sure. think so. I don't think so. Um. Um. I think. They were trying to establish cultural baselines for each group, though. Right. And also right. a visual consistency between all of them. Because really, the dwarves are an opportunity to do something very different. Right. I right. mean, dwarves technically have a, a base image in all our minds. I mean, I think the way they did Gimli in the movies is kind of typical of what people think of dwarves anyways, even before that movie came out. Right. Um, right. I don't think people thought of, like, the Disney the white version. Um on something's going off on my computer right now um but uh it's completely distracting i have to turn it <laughs> off <laughs> no problem it was just a really weird beeping thing because i left my email open and my phone's connected to my email but um what was i saying um yeah cultural base science um we don't have to make them look like the elves and we shouldn't but we kind of used up a lot of uh 
cultural basis from our own from our own world on the elves already. So it's like, well, what hasn't been done? Right. Um, so I think pulling from other other things will visually make them different and more interesting. But we can still use uh, these base images that are in, kind of embedded into our culture mm-hmm. because I think. People think of dwarves like, like I was saying before, I got distracted. Like the Snow White dwarves, people don't think of those dwarves as the same as, uh, like D and D style, Tolkien style dwarves. They're like two right. different things. Just like people distinguish between different types of fairies, it's like Tinkerbell fairies, and there's other fairies. Right. I think right. people do naturally distinguish them based on context, and they're not just one sole version. I have the forum up right now uh, where Harangil posted these. Mm-hmm. Um, so the bottom, uh, let me just, the bottom picture, I, I don't know if you can read it. It's petty dwarves uh, on the left, broad beams in the middle, and fire beards. Um, and the comment okay, on the it. The ones is, appearing in this movie. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the comments on it were that the early dwarves would be more practical. This is Herangil. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. I hope I am. Um, and then they don't become it, they don't get fancy until they um, start trading with other people. Right. And then the picture on the right, the from top to bottom, it's broad beams on the left, long beards on the right, black locks on the left, iron fists on the right, stiff beards on the left, stone foots on the right. Mm-hmm. And then, um, so the the comments for the stiff beards were that they were northern or Siberian. Um, okay. It is to evoke their cold environment. The iron fists would be cell swords and traders in metals and uh, vaguely Sarmatian or Hun. The black locks would be darker hair and complexion, um, like pre Aryan Indian tribes, and the stone foots would be stoic miners um, with sort of ancient Chinese cultural references hmm. in there. Okay. So that's that that that's hair and girls sort that's of. That's interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, um, I sort of did the same thing as him, but like separately. Mm-hmm. And like, I, we didn't see each other's work because I wasn't on the forums and I no one's seen what's on the next slide until we get to there. I literally finished it yesterday. Um, <laughs> but it's weird because there's some similarities. Because I always, I always like looking at how um, art from books especially the Silmarine, is developed separately and then how it somehow looks the same when it's together, even <laughs> right. though there's no information in the book. It's like how everyone pictures Smaug the same, except for the animated one, which will never make any sense. Never. But, um, <laughs> never make any sense. Just like, yeah. So, I, yeah, I noticed some things that are like, where maybe it's just something to do with the words. Like, we only have like one word for a lot of these cultures and yet that sort of evokes certain things maybe right. because it's like, well, it can't be like the traditional Scandinavian dwarf, which are the long beards. So how does this word in that context of that known dwarf, right. like what does that culturally make you think of? Uh, so there's some, there's there's a bunch of differences, but I was like, oh, hey, there's some similar ideas here. Right. Now, uh, Karita was pointing out, and I, this is also something that I found very striking here. Um, uh, Haringo has imagined the dwarf women as veiled. That seems very interesting to me. Um, I, I I remember talking to Miss Lewin about this uh, when we went over kind of the ideas, and mm-hmm. I think that idea came about because the hosts you were very wishy washy about dwarf <laughs> women having beards. Yes, um, beards are so, too beautiful to be seen. Um, anyone, and so the compromise was having them be veiled, and I am very against that idea. I'm very, I'm very for idea. dwarf women with beards. Okay. Um, so I think that was kind of uh, Herringill's idea to, to show sort of that compromise in okay. a visual form. It yeah. was because he really wanted them to have beards too, but yeah. he was just pretending they did. He was hiding them from you. <laughs> <I guess. laughs> yeah. The idea that dwarf women's beards are just too beautiful for public viewing is, is kind of interesting, actually. Uh, um, I have lots of problems with that idea. I understand. I understand. Uh, uh, and I think, is it the next slide that you guys are making your pitch for beards? Yeah. But before we go to the next uh, slide, no, I just wanted to... Not, not yet. Not yet, okay. Um, it's like, it's, I think, point. the slide after the next one. Okay. Yeah. okay. Um, but before we go to that, there was a bit of a discussion about the dwarves of Belagost 
being the armor makers and the dwarves of Nagrod being the jewelry makers. Mm -hmm. And um, while I was talking to Mithluin about this, I mentioned, and I haven't been able to find the reference again, but there is a particular period in history where it was either the French or the English. Mm -hmm. They put up tariffs on imported cloth so that they would um, so that they would promote their own sort of textile makers. Right. And what ended up happening is that their That's local right. textile makers were not very good. Right. They were only good at ribbons. So the, the clothing of that particular period has a ton of ribbons all over it right. because of this political Wait, thing. Wait, this might explain a painting period that I'm thinking <laughs> of right now. Um, like, I, Usually I'm like, I have like the weird art history and she has the fashion thing. I'm like, wait, these are the same thing. <laughs> like, we're like, we're well, we get about... a lot of our fashion history from art history, yeah. right, <laughs> I have right. to say. Um, we just so, don't really so like then, talking about this. <laughs> yeah. So then the L, or so then the dwarves um, of Belagos, because they're good at making armor, their clothing would then be reminiscent of armor. Right. And the dwarves of Nagrod, because they're good at making jewelry their clothing would then be reminiscent of jewelry or feature jewelry in a more um like i, I think the nog in a bigger the way is in a cave if i remember i get the details mixed up because i mixed my notes up when i was working on dwarves the past six months and it's just like oh no <laughs> i mixed them up but i think i think nograd is in a cave so i was thinking of how like crystals naturally form in a cave right. so you get more like jewel stuff anyways just from their environment versus right. Right. Maybe right. Belagos is more on a mountain and coming right. up at the peaks and coming out and being more stone anyways. Right. So one really basic question. What is dwarf clothing made of? What kind of fabrics do dwarves have? What would they mostly wear? Um, I, th I think people tend to, with the, the dwarves and the elves, they get these weird ideas in their head, especially the last 15 years or so mm -hmm. it's like how the elves are randomly vegetarians now but there's no evidence of them being that no. like you get that like, Lots in the of movie, like that doesn't really yeah. make sense yeah there's yeah and it's like uh the dwarves must not live outside i'm like the dwarves lived on their own for a long time yeah the dwarves of erebor relied on um the men to get their food because they happened to be there and that was a fluke and it was a nice little community and you get that right. a few times but right. the dwarves existed by themselves they had to have had livestock they had to have farming they they weren't completely subterranean right right but i can see yeah. them having more emphasis awful. on leathers because there is this kind of idea that dwarves are less caring of the natural world yeah yes. they definitely so, more leather yeah, yeah so that they, makes a like, lot of sense yeah. So like Bree was saying, they'd have sort of the same kinds of fabrics that other peoples would have. They might make them a little differently. Um, but aside from having maybe more leather, I can't see them having a huge difference in the, the particular fibers that they would be making their clothing out of. You know what I mean? Maybe they'd be more inclined to have thicker fabrics just because they're thicker people. Um, yeah. So instead of silks, you get wools and... Mm -hmm. more stiff fabric maybe like that just creating like a, t a feeling uh yeah. like the way it would feel like if you're touching it or just even the way you're seeing it right right and How another interesting way yeah. um another interesting thing that i thought of is that caves in general are cold however when you get close to like when you get subterranean close to the middle closer to the middle of the earth it gets mm -hmm. warm right so maybe there would be like a differentiation between the dwarves living in caves that are cold and the dwarves living in right. deep caves that are warmer. Right. But right. yeah, I think I was actually doing that. That I was. I think I was also matching the Belgos dwarfs is like, since they're not in a cave, maybe they'd be like having watchtowers if they're in the at the top of the mountain. So it's cold up in those mountains. Right. <laughs> I guess I don't know. Right. right. Like you just get these weird like ideas in your head. And you're like, why don't? Why am I even thinking that? I don't know where that came from and it's probably some weird sentence you read in the book five years ago and you don't remember reading it it's just stuck in your head yeah. yeah no I agree I mean thinking about different altitudes not just uh, Anastasia as you were suggesting subterranean um, altitudes or 
sub altitudes or however you describe that. <laughs> um, but but yeah, some dwarves would live up in the mountains, and so you would have some that would be exposed to cold and and you know underground. You know, even if even if most of your underground works are up in the mountains, it's still gonna be it's still gonna be fairly cold up there, right? Compared to plus underground, it's crowded down there. There's a lot of sweaty dwarves. All of that body heat. And forges and oh, things like that. Up. Yeah, yeah. Oh, exactly. yeah, the forges too. Yeah, yeah. So absolutely, that that throws that throws quite a bit of heat. Um, yeah, one can imagine it was. Uh, uh, as I was just doing a bunch of historical stuff, and my uh, younger son loves blacksmiths. He loves watching the blacksmiths. So every time we were at historical places in Southern Virginia uh, over the last week, uh, we were I did a lot of standing somewhat near blacksmith forges. And uh, I can imagine if that were in an enclosed space, like a complete like like underground in a, in a cave, that would warm quite a bit <laughs> around it. Uh, so yeah. I definitely think you should foster this desire in your child to be a blacksmith. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. Agreed. Uh, that would that 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 would be cool. That'd be handy. <laughs> so awesome. Should we? Yep. Let move us. To the next slide. Let us. Yes. Okay. So Bree, here's some of your dwarf stuff. I didn't really like. I started drawing some of the spec around December, and then I stopped working on it. And then I tried working on it this week, and I didn't really finish but this is as close as it's going to be for today. Cool. Um, I, I tend to have the same creative impulses as Tolkien, the fact that if I don't like something, I won't just throw it away. I'll just keep drawing on top of it until it's good. <laughs> right. <laughs> so uh, I need to draw on top of it some more. Um, yeah, so I well, was mainly trying to think of different ethnicities and how the dwarves are all spaced out and based on how they migrate and how they intermingled. Right. Um, long beards, I mean, they're Scandinavian looking. I use a lot of um, Scandinavian culture, uh, more the Nordic, not like the indigenous people. Right. Um, I tried to use more um, indigenous Northern looks and more like Hun style looks for, for Bella Goss, just cause I was thinking like broad and thick and you think of those people as the broad because of how they're depicted usually in movies, but also because they were just wearing a lot of clothing. Right, right. Okay. Uh -huh. yeah. And then I had the fire beards more, like I gave them hammers and things as their weapons because we were thinking of them forging, even though they're the jewel people. But I, I didn't really, I don't know, I just felt like it worked with them. I thought of them having like dual hammers. Uh, the broad beans, I have that axe there, but I'm not really married to it. I don't really like it. Okay. Um, but I was more thinking of them having big, square, Roman-styled shields. Yes, um, I like They were that. a little more dwarven-looking with their masks, because I just think of them being just as... Like, the Romans would just make walls as they marched in. I think that's the only way they could have dealt with uh, Glaurong. I think that's how it's kind of described with them. Yes. Doing at the you know, Battle of Num a Number of Tears, in addition to the masks, I mean, they would have had to just be this giant shield so squares, square shapes again, just yeah. to make them a giant wall together. Yeah, the I, I I really like the tower shield concept for Belgast. And now the other thing, of course, one of the sort of famously distinctive elements of dwarf armor that Tolkien mentions is chainmail. Right, he uh, alludes explicitly to mm -hmm. uh, to dwarves as the inventors of chainmail. Uh, were you thinking of having that be explicitly a Belgast thing? Um, Belgas is the inventors of chain. I was associating it more with them. I was thinking it more of them. It's probably just because we see them in like a battle battle versus uh, right. the Firebirds. We just kind of see them murdering elf kings. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. That's the only time we see them fighting is when they're at war with uh, Doriath. Yeah. Really. So I do think of one being more military watchtower esque. Right. Versus right. one more like craftsman esque. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Um, mm -hmm. Like you get the Firebirds, you think of forges as well. So. Yeah, so it's continuing like flame wave thing versus just the square thing. Um, the other ones b besides like the main three we actually see in the series, I just sort of made up. <laughs> right. Not, like, whatever. Um, so they're not as important because they're not ever shown, but just like you go over them quickly. Uh, black locks. I mean, we get the word black, so I was thinking um, more darker complexion, but I was also thinking lock, like lock picking, mechanical devices, D and D rogue. Right. So that sort of right. idea more buckles and little 
parts and they probably have more tools. Uh, Iron Fist, I was thinking of like Turkish wrestlers for some reason and I just gave them like iron gloves. Uh, stiff beards, I was thinking of uh, how thick uh, East Asian hair is and maybe you could make some like stiff beards out of that. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't, material of hair doesn't really make sense but that like hair is different than right. like Western hair which is not as like stiff. Right. So right. I was thinking of jade empire stuff because i thought oh well carving jade stuff because uh dwarven art and then i did something similar with the iron foots who ended up being more inca and aztec stuff because i was thinking of the stone carvings there but how they're also mountain people naturally that exist in our world so i was doing stuff like that right cool yeah i like it i'm probably gonna draw over all of this stuff though i i really like the (laughs) the 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 Nograd and Belga stuff here. Like I said, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of the, um, of the, the tower shield thing. I agree. Thinking of, uh, a bunch of, you know, ranks of dwarves of Belagost with their tower shields and their masks, um, standing up to Glaurung is, that's really perfect. Cause you're right. That would be, um, a way to make them very distinctive in their ability to resist the dragon and dragon fire. You can, you, you can imagine, you know, Glaurung's fire just sort of sweeping, you know, whooshing over their shields and masks and uh and and you know and not really touching any of them uh um really have you like ever that. seen the animated movie uh secret of kells i don't think so maybe it's 2d i've heard of it um but it, I there's this irish studio it. it's by this irish studio they've made up like three movies now on the way they show the vikings coming in to invade these um irish settlements is they're just giant squares and the movies more um out um there's more shape language and less realism so when they're marching together just a giant rectangle thing coming towards everyone it's taking up the whole screen it's just this black square and you can see sort of viking horns on top of it but it's i don't know it's pretty good <laughs> right cool in terms of design yeah yeah cool cool all right Awesome. Well, we're starting to run out of time, so I, we should we should move forward here. This is oh, this is the appeal for for bearded dwarf women. Do you like this passive aggressive slide? Yeah, I think it's pretty is, great. This is a very great passive aggressive slide. Okay, so if like there is a very general movement for dwarf, for dwarf bearded women. I, you know, I'm not going to resist it until the end. I'm not massively anti-bearded dwarf women. Um, mostly, I just kind of dislike the um, the kind of joking stereotype of it. You know, I, and I, I wouldn't want to play it for laughs. Um, no, I don't think and, so. and oh, absolutely are, not. Yeah, they would no. receive the same amount of respect as any other character on the show. Yeah. Like, if you if you just I write them as this is a normal on. thing, then people won't joke about it. Right, right. Yeah, and I mean, there were some in like the concept art book of the Hobbit movies, and I remember like the internet found them and they freaked out about them, like in a good way. But I felt like they were kind of weak. I mean, they were kind of like, like really, they weren't very great beards. They were just kind of like these wispy things that was like, that's not even designed for, like if, right. like, if you had a beard, like you didn't really do anything with your beard, just kind of sitting there. Um, yeah, I don't know. I would like you, okay, so. Do more than that. Would there be a distinction? What would be the distinction? Or would there be any? Would dwarf women and dwarf men, in fact, look exactly alike? Would they be mostly indistinguishable? Would there be, you know, would... Essentially, among dwarves, then, would we speculate that facial hair is any part of secondary sexual characteristics in dwarves, or just not? They'd be the same. I think they would wear it slightly differently. So They'd wear it differently, but it would grow similar. It would grow the same. Okay. Right. So yeah. we're just imagining. I also that. think there would probably be naturally less hair still. I mean, because you have not as like thin and wispy as I was talking about before. Right. But right. C- think of how long the beards are supposed to be on the males. Right. They're supposed to be way longer than we ever saw in the movies. Right. Well, <laughs> so, especially like, for the just long Just the normal yeah. human beard would look. Yeah. Better than what we got, and it wouldn't. It would still be less. So I think like just designing it with female shapes and like the women still 
physically, I think, look very similar to the men uh, in dwarves. Um, but there's still subtle things you can do the shapes to make them just like you can still tell it's a woman if you but maybe if they're in war together you might not tell right away which is kind of the feeling we get from the text anyways that we might have seen the female dwarves but we weren't paying attention right right yeah i mean i guess my um i mean the reason i'm talking about secondary sexual characteristics is that i mean obviously among humans it's just a major difference right i mean that it, it female right. facial hair just is you know never is the same um, i mean it exists in biology i mean it's a thing. right exactly but yeah. with you know but of course like hair on the head in general is not a secondary sexual characteristic right i mean like of course there are many differences and many individual differences and lots of differences in styling right uh and women don't tend to go bald as often but i mean in general like it's not like a secondary sexual characteristic to have hair on your head or not and the hair of men and the hair of women uh, although again stylistic changes are made um it's 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 not like intrinsically different generally right so if we wanted to go that same way with the dwarves to say that dwarf beards are like human head hair in the sense of all dwarves have you know, although there are individual variations and they may have stylistic choices, dwarf women may choose to do a particular thing with their beards uh, that men don't. Again, just as, you know, how hair is worn among men and women, there are, you know, trends, stylistic trends um, in different cultures. So, you know, again, we can we can do that kind of thing. But I would be I would be fine with that if that's where, where we want to go. Um, uh, again, I think my really my primary um my primary resistance to it is that it tends like it tends to be a joke that people make. It was a joke that was made in the films and a joke that many people enjoy as a joke about the bearded dwarf women. Um, and I didn't, I would, I would, <clears throat> I would rather not do that. And I would certainly rather not have, um, I mean, I agree with you about the wispy beards and stuff. Like we need to go all the way or not. I think, you know, uh, like either they all have beards or, the women don't have beards, but mm-hmm. the idea of having I just like, I think the women are very attractive. It's not <laughs> like, very attractive. Eh, it's it's kind it of silly. Like if, if they either, like if they grow beards, have them grow beards. If they don't grow beards, have them not grow beards. You know, this is not just like, you know, mm-hmm. to, and they were in the background too. So I was like, who cares if you commit? No one's going to notice except weirdos like us. Right. And <laughs> so even, like, even from a, even from a, um, like a, a, a whole, whole, like gender perspective, right? The idea of having women be half-hearted men, you know, like, come on, like, seriously? No, that's, 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 you know, um, you, you can tell that's that. actually, oh, yeah, sorry, go um, ahead. That, that leads into something that I was thinking about dwarf costuming, which was there is evidence in the text that there isn't a significant demarcation in terms of gender roles. Mm-hmm. So uh, I can't remember what, where the reference comes from but there is specifically a place in the text where tolkien explains why dwarf population increases slowly yes Yes. and that is because there are very few dwarf women and the dwarf women that there are are more interested in doing their projects than they are interested in having families yes Yes. which to me indicates that it's um, very acceptable in dwarf culture for women to do very similar things to men um, and so in that sense, there wouldn't need to be a significant uh, difference between male and female clothing. Yes. The difference yes. would primarily be what your job is, right? right? So maybe if right. a dwarf woman was raising a family, she would have more sort of family oriented clothing. But if the dwarf woman is at the forge making cool stuff, then she would be wearing appropriate she, to forge she would clothing. She like a smith, right? right, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, um, which he, might be why it's so hard to tell the difference is because their demarcations are based on their jobs rather than their gender. Right, right, right. Um, yeah. The yeah. other no, thing sense to I me. think with the beards, it's treated. I think it's been treated as a joke yeah. because we were never. No one thought we would ever get it, so it's just like, hey. <laughs> right. So, right. But if we, we do make it properly, then never gonna happen. We can, yeah, we can, we can break through that. Yeah, yeah. And I and actually want to because we see beards on female, human, real women, and not uh, female people with dwarven 
uh, proportions. Right. Which would require prosthetics and stuff. So I think if we design a face that's meant to have a beard but still be female and not just like tacked on to right. a human right. female, I think right. that will go a long way as well. Because they they don't look like us. Not quite. I right. mean, that's the whole thing. Right. Exactly. All way and stuff. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So no, that's, I, I, I think that that's, I think that's good. I think that makes sense. Okay. We should move along as we're going to completely run out of time to talk about any of the bad guys, which would be sad. Um, um, just so that we know, um, I'm just, I'm going to put information about the, the pictures that we put up there. Cause some of them are actual people and I want to just make sure, okay, sure. that um, people know. Who well, they're they all and... actual people. <laughs> well, but like, but we're giving credit. Yeah. I know cosplay groups and stuff. Yeah. 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 So I'll okay. put, I'll put links up in the forum. Great. Great. Um, Okay, cool. So, uh, so he, here we have some of Hirongil's sketches for the villains. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, it's mainly the Ang Bang gang. Yeah, and yes. uh, the the comment that was made about Ang Band is that Harangil was thinking that Ang Band would be like the high point of the evil culture. Mm-hmm. So, like, they would have sort of all of the things that you would imagine that a very developed culture would have in Angband, and then it would sort of slowly deteriorate as the ages right. went on. Right. Um, so that's I think that's kind of what he's trying to show in this uh, left-hand picture is, uh, I think it was Morgoth with sort of his retinue, I guess. Right. <laughs> Let me find that bit on the, on the forums. Right. Yeah, yeah, it's it's clearly kind of a concept sketch, right? Of uh, yeah, of how this of of how it would look. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So I think the idea that was stated was that it's more like evil at its most organized point, where right. they built up all this stuff, and then it's going to be falling apart for the next couple of thousand years. Yes. So it needs to be high enough that yes. it's, it, it falls apart at the end of the War of the Ring, and not sooner. Basically. Right. And it's already a, you know, so we had, in a sense, of course, the the pinnacle of evil, you know, organization and artistry was Utumno, right? So I would think, like, what was on display when Manwe comes to uh, appeal, to make his final appeal to Melkor near the end of season one would be the real pinnacle of things. But it's different then, right? We, we didn't have the whole evil crew, right? Um, but anyway, so Angman has already, in a sense, fallen from that. We no longer have just pure gorgeousness. We have everything tainted by the hatred and rage, which uh, is really dominating Morgoth now. Um, uh, but um, uh, but anyway... But, yeah, but Morgoth I, doesn't really fall apart until Angband. I mean, right, he exactly. has the potential to become as great as he was when, after his imprisonment, but then he doesn't. So it doesn't really start until after he gets his emeralds that it right. starts falling apart for him. Right, right, agreed. Okay, so we have so so with Morgoth, we have these are uh, I know so Bree, these are some of your drawings up there on the top left, right? Yeah, I was. Oops, I muted myself. <laughs> um, uh, I had this gif where I had it um, transitioning between like yeah. his um, Melkor form to his Morgoth form mm-hmm. and I was trying to have the helm change to the helm he eventually has so I was having it like fire and um, Harangil did similar sketches of the helm below that right right but everyone's pretty much on board the like the three spikes on a helm for each of the whole thing. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I know that makes a lot of sense. Um, how inhuman would it also we looks want... like the three mountains of Angband. So. Yes, exactly. No, there's lots of benefits there. Um, how inhuman would we want him to look as Morgoth? Like when he when he comes in the especially in the like the post Ungoliant stage of things, right? After he's been uh, he's been rescued and he's, his, he's been burned, you know, his hand has been burned. Um, uh, would we want his humanity to be, and we want his humanity to kind of decrease over time, right? Yeah. I have this really specific image that I've yet to be able to capture. I've tried drawing it a few times. Just, one day I'll get it. Um, where he looks like he has normal coloring of a person who's alive. Uh, once he gets the sim- like the point, he steals the emeralds because he had they haven't like 
he's not his power isn't like seeping into the whole Morgoth ring concept yet. Um, but after that point, it is. So I thought that ah, his power goes away, like he's sort of like draining, and to show that in a physical way, maybe he becomes paler as like one color fading right. slowly, and then it's just like his eyes become paler and he comes more like a statue right sort of right in that sense and less of like a living person because he becomes less and less and less and less and that's really it's to show that it's like he's defeating himself yes yes more than anything um, else yeah yeah exactly <laughs> Uh, uh, Tony suggests he should start out as hot goth and become more and more necrotic as time oh, goes yeah. on. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, exactly. Um, necrotic, I think, is exactly it, right? He should look more and more, not like a rotting corpse exactly. I mean, we, we don't want like bits of him falling off, but more, yeah. as you say, more inhuman, more like a statue, less, less living. Less, uh-huh. uh, and he's more armored too, and armor is not, armor is not alive. Yes. I mean, cloth isn't either, but you see it moving more, so it's, right, it's right. more animated, which is, right. you know, alive in a different sense. Right. So he's just, and he's just becomes more sedentary too. Yes, so. and 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 more, you know, conveying more like an empty shell, right? Which I think is a really good image for yes. Morgoth in the yeah. later, uh, in in the later era. Okay, um, so Gothmog and the orcs. Um, now Gothmog. We want Gothmog to be, I mean, of course, the Balrog's not enormously distinct. So, um, did we decide what we wanted the Balrogs to look like? We kind of needed to have decided this, right? I, don't, I think we, you guys mainly just said what you didn't want them to look like. <laughs> well, yeah. Mainly just like knowing. <laughs> Right. Over and over again was what I re- usually remember you saying, and I always try to sneak in the fact that they still have wings, but they're just like smoke. <laughs> they're not really wings. It's just like a projection <laughs> mentally. Right. Right. <laughs> it still um, looks cool, but they're not actually flyable. Right. Um. He has dreams. Has. Well, because um, they have because they remember they their ever... wings, right? They used to have wings. Yeah. And they still remember yeah. their wings. So like their fea are like still kind of winged, but their hroa aren't anywhere. The hroa in which they're encased, you know, the yeah, bodies like in which they're encased. Drawing on the left is fiery wings. Maybe I see like a little line there, right. which would make sense. Like if you have the fire, that so one. It's, like if on the fire the went left? out, it'd probably just be like broken. Wings, yeah. Maybe. Yeah. It looks like there are some. Gothmog. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, yeah. so the the uh, yeah. the comments I that Aaron Gill has about them being um, yes. Yeah. Um, is that he does wear armor, and it's very fine scale. Do, 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 do. Um, he wears clothes made of some do, 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 fabric that has sort of a flame pattern on it, and a, a the three peaks of Thangora Drim. Um, and he has burned skin and the remains of former wings is what that left hand picture is evoking. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'm totally fine with, I'm willing to certainly make this compromise with, I like, I, I know, and I've talked about this a lot. Like I, I totally understand why visual artists always want Balrogs to <laughs> have wings. Talking about like, it, for like it looks cool. Right. I mean, I totally get that. Um, uh, and I love so the cool. way. I, I, I kind of really like the way in which the our like the story that we developed for the Balrogs, you know, the whole fallen angels thing about Balrogs, does allow for that, right? Like again, they remember their wings, like they've lost them and they can't get them back, um, but they remember them, right? And so we can have either flamey, flaming or shadowy wings, um, uh, uh, again, as like with the memory of their. Uh, of 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 their flying and stuff, uh, face scarred, hideous, still attractive. What do we think about the face of the bow? Of faces of and human still looking like I mean, you know, not like with muzzles and horns and things like that. I'm presuming, right? Um, still, it looks like he has his drawing that it's burned. Burned. Yeah, he yes. says that it's. It's burned. Which would make sense if they're like sort of burning themselves. Right. In right. terms of self destruction theme. Yeah, the the idea of like flame emerging from them, but as if the flame is itself damaging them at the same time, I think would be evocative of the kind of spiritual state of the Balrog that we're attempting to describe. You know, less mm-hmm. like less like 
um, someone who is merely like a, a, you know, composed of flame and shadow, like that has been made from scratch from flame and shadow, uh, or the, like a fire elemental or something like that, and more like someone who has been burned, right? Which they have. It was their own fault, right? And it's it's their own I think choice. Two but... poss- I think there's two possible looks, maybe maybe more than two, but um, I think maybe what everyone's thinking about is uh, skin that's healed, but maybe, maybe, you know how like horrible skeletons look when they get burned, they're just like black, Mm-hmm. And there's the skin has shrunk all the way around the skeleton. It's right. still there, but it's not right. really there. Right. Maybe like something like that, and then you can make a cool skull shape that's black, and yeah. it's like the fires kind of blend. It. Maybe something like that. I'm coming up with this right now. No, but, the, yeah. the idea of the Balrogs having om- like almost naked skulls, as you say, like black and leathery skin. So, so right, not like. A person with a normal face with burned skin, but rather, you yeah, because that implies healing, right? Burned down, you know, exactly. It implies healing, burned yeah. down almost to the bone, so that it, they have almost a death's head skull look. Um, that would be uh, scary, um, and uh, I, I kind of like that actually. Balrogs are scary. <laughs> Balrogs are scary. Them. They should be scary. And you should, I mean, and, and if they look like a death's head, well, like that's good, right? That's kind of, uh, you know, that's, that is a, that is a look we would go for. Um, but not too much like that one. I think it's a Marvel character was what's his name. Um, oh, the, um, the, are you thinking of the yeah, I can't think of dude on that. the motorcycle with the, uh, yeah, yeah, motorcycle. Uh, yeah. Yes. I not, should remember well, that, not so metal is that. Not so metal is that. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Ghost Rider. Thank you, Zach. Uh, yes. Ghost Rider. Ghost Rider. That's what yes. I kept seeing Skull Rider. I'm like, that's not right. That's, that's right. Okay. That's right. Right concept, wrong name. Yes. Ghost Rider. Yeah. It shouldn't, it shouldn't, it shouldn't look, uh, like Ghost Rider. I agree. Um, but um, especially since Ghost Rider was more naked skull, you should still be able to see the skin. Like it should, it should like, like a skull yeah. with like black wax melted on it almost, you know, would be like more. Bot, like not, not Legend of Zelda school laughing in a little flame ball. Right. Exactly. Not like that. Not like that. Um, yes. Yeah. Good. Okay. So um, I was going to say we're running out of time. I'm actually significantly over time now and I should go pretty soon. Um, but uh, I, I, Oh, make the call if you need to make the call. I do need to make the call, and my call is between okay. rushing through the rest of the bad guys super fast, um, or saving some for next time. Could you guys come a little bit at the beginning of next time? Uh, when um, is next time? Two weeks from today. Yeah. Maybe um, I might only be able to do chat, but I might okay. be able to do it. Okay. Depends. All right. Work. That's fine. That's fine. We can we'll we can uh, we can talk about some we can talk about some stuff because I, I, I don't want to half the slides, which is about right. We did no we did, we're we've only got like two left of the of the design slides. Well, I meant I total, but we were total never going to do the yeah, other ones. Yeah, no, like, that was not going to happen. Yeah, because we have uh, we have we have the orcs still to talk about, and then like Thorin Gwethil, right? I mean, you know, come on, we still got Thorin Gwethil. Oh yeah. Um, it was- not to mention, I think we have uh, uh, Tavildo stuff. Oh, Dragluin and mm-hmm. Tavildo. Yeah, yeah okay. So we have... Like, the Aang Bang Gang. And, yeah, yeah, we we got to finish it. We, we can't... And orcs. Like, we can't... We, we got to talk about orcs uh, in more than 30 seconds. So, um, okay. All right. Well, so let's, let's... We'll finish up the Aang Band Gang uh, at the beginning of next time. And then we're doing casting. So, that's... That's fine. We can totally make that work. That'll that'll absolutely happen. Um, so let me wrap up then, and thank you guys so much, not only for your uh, uh, for your work, but for your uh, your time today. This was super helpful. I learned so much. Not only that smocking is a verb, uh, <laughs> and a verbal noun, right? I mean, this is fantastic. Um, uh, but no, I mean, I, I learned a very great deal from you guys today, and uh, this is uh, this is really neat. I love thinking about this stuff in this way. You know, cl- uh, clothing and costume design is normally not one of the things that I am especially independently interested in but it's really great to talk about it with folks who know about it so that we can focus you know so enabling me to 
to, to, to ask questions and focus on the, the sort of the world building and character development and story elements of this stuff uh, because that's uh, that's really cool and there's a lot to talk about there uh, and, uh, yes, and it's all just storytelling just in different modes <laughs> exactly exactly and you guys were super helpful with that so thank you guys so much welcome awesome okay uh so uh we will sign off i'm gonna head over to my grifflet stream here in just a minute um thanks again for joining us and uh we will be back in two weeks that is which date is that gonna be that's gonna be the 13th yes friday the 13th of july will be our next session where we will finish up uh the the visual design stuff and then it would finish talking about the bad guys and then we will do casting which means um our nominations for casting uh are are, are closing we're gonna have the um uh, the, the, the voting link. So we're going to be electing uh, our, 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 our folks, our actors and actresses between uh, now and next time. So be on the lookout in the forums for the link to the, uh, uh, to the, the, the survey so that you can vote on uh, who should be uh, portraying whom. Uh, and of course, we have links to the uh, to all the nominations in the forum and stuff. So you'll wanna you'll wanna look at that, and then we'll be announcing the winners next time, which is always uh, which is always a fun time. And then I get in trouble if I don't veto the correct ones and everything. So uh, that, that's always fun. Anyway, <laughs> thank you guys. Uh, thanks everybody for joining us. Thank you guys for your help. And I will say as always, thanks for having us. No problem. Thank you. Yeah. That was great. Uh, and I will say as always, thanks for listening and Godspeed.